see the shining sea. I've seen a lot of places, people that were nice to me. One place that's in my heart, and this is how I feel. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. She's nestled in the sand hills on a river called Cake Field. Special to so many who proudly served our country here. She was named for Lafayette and known for cotton mills. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. My hometown, Fayetteville I'm so proud to be from here It don't take long when you're away from home To find out how you feel It's always good to come home to Fayetteville Babe Ruth hit his first one, heard around the world. Sherman marched for the Union and burned the arsenal. Old Market House still standing, but stands for freedom's will. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. Take long when you're away from home to find out how you feel. It's always good to come home to Fayetteville, my all American city, Fayetteville. Talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. We'll call the Fayetteville uh, City Council April 23rd meeting to order. We appreciate uh, everyone being here with us tonight. And we ask that you stand for our invocation led tonight by Reverend Ong Su Hong, who is a senior pastor at the New Life Community Church of Fayetteville. And if you remain standing for our pledge. All right. Let us just bow down our head and then uh, pray. Dear wise and loving Father, First, let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself and for the measures of health we need to fulfill our callings for sustenance and for friendship. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thanks as well for the freedom to live out in this country. Thank you for loving us even so from your boundless and gracious nature. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to be obeyed the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, Lord, we pray for our mayor for the various levels of city officers, and in particular, for this assembly council. I'm asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issue of our times. 
Lord, a sense of the welfare and true need of our people. A king's thirsty for justice and righteousness. Confidence in what is good and fitting. The ability to work together in harmony. Even when there is honest disagreement. Personal peace in their lives and joy in their tasks. We pray for the agenda set before them today. Please give assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved city of Fayetteville. It is in your most precious name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <clears throat> We have several recognitions uh, that we'd like to share with you tonight, and we'll begin by calling Ms. Roberta Water with the National Organization of Women to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I need Stacy Sanders to join me here. <laughs> Mayor Shivani, council members and staff, and ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for allowing me to come before you this evening. I know you have a long agenda. Fayetteville Now, the National Organization for Women, is a local branch of the state and national organization. Uh, I have some fellow members here. I would like those members to stand, if you would. Thank you. We work to de eliminate discrimination, particularly against women where we see it. Some of you may remember our march down Hay Street last, for women's votes last August, which was a celebration of the passage of the 19th Amendment of, to the Constitution, confirming women's right to vote. However, we are not always looking backwards. We look forward to the coming political season to improve the status of women, we follow domestic violence cases in the district court to see that justice uh, achieved in difficult circumstances. We've demonstrated, lobbied, written letters to the editor, and spoken out where possible about discrimination. But we're here tonight to present our Susan B. Anthony Award to our 2012 honoree. First, I'll tell you a little bit about Susan B. Anthony. Susan Brennell Anthony, was a prominent American civil rights leader who played a pivotal role in the 19th century women's rights movement to introduce women's suffrage into the United States. She traveled the United States and Europe and gave 75 to 100 speeches every year on women's rights for 45 years. Susan even voted in Rochester, New York in 1872 in the presidential election which was illegal. Officials indicted her and levied a fine, but I'm proud to say she never paid it, nor did she go to jail. She was born February 15, 1820, and died March 13, 1906. Uh, that was several years before women actually got the suffrage. On February 16, 2012, <coughs> we celebrated her 192nd birthday. Each year, we choose a woman who has achieved in non-traditional way ways. This year, we not only chose a woman who has achieved in non-traditional ways, but we have also chosen a public servant who goes above and beyond her call of duty every day. So this is a tribute not only to the Fayetteville Police Department Homeless Project Officer, Stacy Sanders, but also to all the other public servants who toil every day for all of us with very little notice. Officer Sanders has served in the U.S. Army. She has a Bachelor of Criminal Justice from Fayetteville State, has worked for the Fayetteville Police Department for almost 12 years, she has been the homeless project officer for eight years, and she has a beautiful daughter. 
I am proud to present Officer Sanders this certificate, which reads, uh, this certificate is awarded to Officer Stacy Sanders for service to <coughs> homeless people of Fayetteville. Thank you. It is well deserved. She has also re received our Susan B. Award, which is a Susan B. dollar turned into a pendant. Congratulations, Officer Sanders, and congratulations, City Council. You have a great employee. Thank you for your time. We'd now like to introduce two very special ambassadors of our All-America City, and I'm asking Council Member Bobby Hurst, who won this contest tonight, to uh, join us as we invite up Miss Fedville 2012, Casey Hall, and Miss Fedville Outstanding Teen 2012, Emma Carter. Let me tell you a little bit about Miss Hall, our Miss Fedville 2012. She's the daughter of Benny and Joyce Hall of Irwin. She attends Campbell University, where she is a senior pursuing a degree in communication studies with a concentration in public relations and health communication. Upon graduation, she plans to obtain a Master of Science degree in communication from North Carolina State University with the hopes of working in public relations for a nonprofit organization. Casey has completed 15 years of dance instruction. 10 years of vocal instruction, and has participated in numerous plays and musicals. Her many performances include Carnegie Hall in New York City as a member of the National Youth Choir, mm. Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and Disney World. Her personal platform, Stand Up to Cancer, is a campaign dedicated to raising funds for cancer research. The nonprofit organization gives 100% of the donations to scientific researchers and doctors who are devoted to finding a cure for cancer. She'll be representing Fedville in the upcoming Miss North Carolina pageant in June. Miss Casey Hall. <clears throat> I'm going to tilt this up because I have heels on. I would first like to thank everyone on the board for having us here tonight. We are so honored that you would take time of your busy schedules. And Mayor Shivani, I, I met him at the North Carolina USO show in November, and I recognized his face. That was recently after his election, and so I walked up and was like, he's not going to want to talk to me, but I'm going to talk to him instead. <laughs> so I tapped on his shoulder and introduced myself, and he was so kind and gracious. And I want to thank him, and just to let you know, one of your own was our our judges helped choose us, and that's Miss Davy. So we would um, like to thank her. And um, so Emma and I have platforms, and mine is Stand Up to Cancer. Again, like he said, we raise money, and 100% of proceeds go directly to cancer research. And the way they do that is they actually have um, a, the Film Institute donates all money to go to public relations efforts, which is what I hope to do. So they take care of the PR, you know, helping to get celebrities involved. You see commercials. Uh, and, and that's really how they go about that, so they can donate 100% of proceeds. And I know that if we encourage the Film Institute to keep doing that, we can continue to have that money to um, raise awareness for car new carcinogens and to try to help uh, find something that can combat those new carcinogens. And um, without further ado, it is time for my beautiful team. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me tell you a little bit about Miss Carter, our Miss Fedville Outstanding Teen 2012. She's the daughter of Bobby and Sharona Carter. She's a homeschooled ninth grader who enjoys singing and playing several different instruments. Emma loves to travel and is involved with her family's Southern Gospel Ministry and the praise band at her church. In addition to her musical talents, Emma enjoys dance, photography, and writing. She will represent Fedville as she advised for the title of Miss North Carolina Outstanding Teen 2012 in June. Her platform is microcephaly cephaly, awareness, a childhood disease where the head circumference is less than it should normally be causing severe, severe developmental delays. Congratulations to both of you. Ms. Carter, would you have share something with us? I can, I can take 
off these shoes. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you everyone for having me here. Thank you Mayor Shivani and the City Council members and the citizens of Fayetteville. It is an honor to be in this room tonight and um, my platform is Microcephaly Awareness. It is a childhood disorder where children could be born or develop a um, syndrome where their skull does not grow. It puts pressure on their brain and so it causes abnormalities and development issues uh, such as seizures and things such as. And so um, it is great to be here tonight and I am very passionate about my platform and I look forward to representing the City of Fayetteville until October. October when we have to give up our crowns, but it has been an honor and I look forward to the next months to come. Thank you very much. Great job. I'd asked Mr. Hurst to wear his heels, so he did at least tall and he just, he just didn't do it. Okay, we'd now like to call on Honorable Rick Glazier, a member of our North Carolina House of Representatives, for a very special presentation. Representative Glazier. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council and, and City staff. Um, all of us who are in public service know um, what government can and can't do, um, and, and we know the limitations, and we know that um, there are tremendous needs and services that have to be made available to the citizens uh, of our city and our state. And the only way to do that is to engage our community um, in opening their hearts and, uh, and their wallets on occasion um, to, to the service of, of all of our fellow human beings. Some people are simply special um, in how they are able to transform a community um, and to open um, more homes and hearts um, and connections uh, than almost anyone else thought possible. Um, there are certain people who simply by their deeds as well as their words are able to remind us uh, on a daily basis that our responsibility is to each other. Um, and it is my really true privilege to be honoring one of those very special people in our state this evening. I'd like to call up, if I could, Judy Dawkins. Well, that, that may happen yet. For those, um, and there's very few in this room, in fact, very few in our city who don't know Judy. Um, Judy began her career um, uh, in assisting people um, very much quietly and privately and working at Fort Bragg. I was a civil service officer for many years and then transferred to the Veterans Administration. Uh, where she administratively made sure that there were services provided for literally tens of thousands of people. And, and then she retired sort of for about six weeks um, uh, before the city engaged her um, in, in what we know as one of the greatest um, volunteer programs and efforts in the city of Fayetteville or in any city in the state of North Carolina. For 10 years, um, Judy served as the director and um, uh, in every way, uh, the person who made the RSVP program what it is, it saved this city tens of millions of dollars over that 10-year period. It engaged thousands of citizens in serving their fellow band. It created a circumstance that saved people's lives and transformed very severely injured and very severely needy people into people who had self-esteem, and had the capacity to live productive lives, and she did that every day by making sure all of the rest of us knew part of our reason for being was to help each other. So it is my true honor and privilege this evening, and on behalf of the Cumberland County Legislative Delegation, and tonight, with the power vested in me by the Governor of the State of North Carolina, Beverly Eves Purdue, it is my honor to award you on behalf of the Governor of this state the most recent, and to make you the newest honoree in the state of North Carolina of the highest civilian order accorded to any civilian in our state, the Order of the Longleaf Pine. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Frank told me I was coming to a zoning order, and he said, I've got a surprise. You may have a surprise birthday party tonight, and that's all he said. Um, 
Um, it's very rare that I can't think of something to say. On. But when I saw my daughter and, and my friends here, I thought, well, what are they doing in City Hall if we're going to go downtown to eat somewhere for my birthday? But I cannot thank you enough. Um, I know each one of you, I asked you to come. I invited you every year to the RSVP banquet. Tony, I think you only missed one. And that was because you could not help it. You sent someone else. And um, I know I asked a lot of you to participate monetarily for the vol on behalf of the volunteers, and you did. And I can't thank you enough for helping our volunteers. I'm not the director now. I've thought several times since last year, what in the world did I do when I said I was going to retire? Uh, I will say this. I am volunteering in our city and county now. And I would tell you, I've lived here over 50 years. I love Fayetteville, and I love Cumberland County. I love our city, our churches, our everything. And thank you so much, and especially Rick. He came every year, too, except for one. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, I guess. <laughs> going to be hard to top that. Yeah. We'll begin by approval of tonight's agenda. <coughs> Sharp. Motion to approve. Have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Any discussion on that? I'm going to ask for your vote on that motion, please. Okay, that's unanimous. We'll begin with item 5.0, which is tonight's consent agenda. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Mr. Hurst, thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Hart, thanks. Any discussion on that? Let me ask for your vote on the consent agenda, please. All right, that carries. Those in favor, Mr. Chris, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Arp, Ms. Davey, Mr. Hare, Mr. Massey, Mr. Fowler, in opposition, Mr. Bates. We'll turn now to our series of public hearings, and let me read the guidelines for our public hearings as we begin. <laughs> First of all, each side will have a total of 15 minutes to present your position, whether you are for or against. Individual speakers will have one time to speak and will be limited to three minutes each, unless by previous arrangement a single spokesman is designated, in which case the spokesman may use the entire 15 minutes. When you hear the beep and see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, that means there's approximately 30 <coughs> seconds left for the three minutes. And when you hear the beep and see the timer located on the podium, blink and change from yellow to red that means the full three minutes has expired we ask that when your name is called you come to the podium and state your name and address clearly so we can make note of it for the record and we'll begin with item 6.1 p 12 f mr harman thanks for being here sir evening mr mayor council uh first case we have is a an initial zoning uh requests go from a c3 county zoning district to HI in the city. Uh, the property is located at 4433 Claude Lee Road and it's approximately 1.62 acres. <clears throat> uh, you can see on the aerial map here where the property is located. Uh, this is on the south side of I-95. Uh, as you recall, I-95 in this area is our boundary for the MIA, so this property is outside of the city's uh, municipal influence area. Um, and at this point, there is all county completely surrounding it. There's no uh, city limits uh, really anywhere to be found close to this one. Um, currently, uh, it is commercial, it is a record service and uh, salvage yard on this property. Uh, that's actually what brings the petition before you tonight, uh, which will be a later matter. Uh, the owner wishes to stay on the record rotation list for the city, and that's why he's asking that this particular property be annexed. Um, his current property that, that uh, is inside the city uh, is being uh, bought out from him for a, a road widening project and so he's wanting to use property he already owns out in the county uh, for it to become part of the city and be able to maintain his uh, record service. The uh, land use plan does call for heavy commercial uh, on this particular property. 
the green being some conservation and the heavy purple uh, being heavy industrial. Uh, that's mainly a sand pit uh, area at the end of Claude Lee Road, uh, field dirt and stuff. Um, but this area, there's actually more than just the one property that uh, the owner has petitioned tonight that is uh, contains the salvage yard. Uh, these also do, but he's only petitioned the one that has his garage on it. <clears throat> the uh, zoning uh, commission and staff recommend that the property not be zoned into the city. Uh, zoning commission and staff are not in favor of this property being annexed. Uh, just as a reminder, the final action on this item will occur as part of the motion to approve or deny the petition for annexation. Uh, and then just as a side note, if uh, council decides that this is a property that they think is appropriate to be uh, annexed into the city, uh, staff would recommend that it be annexed under the HI district um, since the UDO requirement for salvage yards is that they be uh, located in those HI districts. Are there any questions of staff at this point? We have one, sir, Mr. Arp. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have bumped it. I apologize. Okay. Nope. Stand by. We'll open the public hearing, ma'am. Uh, so we have one speaker for this item, Mr. Larry Brigman. Mr. Griffin. Mr. Larry Brigman. Must not be here, ma'am. Okay. I have no further speakers. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and entertain any additional questions from staff or a motion. Mr. Bates. Uh, Mr. Harmon, would you, you said that his property, current property he has now is being bought out for wide roading. Would you happen to know what road project so, that is? Southern Avenue widening. He's at the corner of Southern Avenue and uh, Mountain Drive. Mm -hmm. And because he's a corner property, they're not only taking the property to widen Southern, but they're also doing some widening to the intersection as well. So between the, the two widenings there for the same project, it, that he's being bought out. All right. Thank you. Any additional questions? Is there a motion? Mr. Hurst. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move to deny the zoning request. Okay. Second uh, by Mr. Bates. Any discussion on the motion, Council? Master your vote, please. <coughs> that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move now to item 6.2, P1217F. Next case we have before you, uh, the requested action. This is another initial zoning. Uh, it's currently R10 in the county. Uh, the request is go to an SF10 in the city. Property is off of Tip Top Road, and it's approximately 28 acres. Uh, you can see here on the aerial photo uh, where the property is located. Um, here's Claude Lee Road. Uh, this is the intersection of Claude Lee and Snow Hill. Uh, you come off of Snow Hill down Ambition Road. And that takes you down to Tip Top, which is down here at the bottom. <clears throat> Currently, it is all county surrounding this. Um, uh, it, the property, phase one of the same subdivision, uh, this area here, was actually petitioned for annexation about five years ago. That petition was not acted upon. Uh, and at this point for phase two, they're coming in asking for annexation of that and uh, for the purpose of having water and sewer available through PWC. Uh, as you can see on the map, there are uh, R10 county zoning here to the south, uh, some R6 zoning uh, to the east, uh, more of the R10 uh, here to the north and a little to the west, and then R15 on this side. Um, all of this is platted uh, development, but it's very old and nothing ever has come of it. No roads or anything were ever built, uh, probably due to the fact that at the time this was way out in the county and would have had to have water and septic systems, and it probably would not support them uh, at that point. Uh, on the land use map, 
mainly single family residential uh, around this property and vacant properties. Uh, this property here, uh, part of it, it does have some commercial on it. Um, then more, this is uh, Research Drive here is where the industrial park uh, is located on. And then again, on the land use plan, calls for low density residential uh, throughout most of this area. Conservation area here in the green. Uh, you can see uh, land for the industrial park back here in the purple. Uh, and then some uh, medium density residential out here on Claude Lee and then commercial on Claude Lee and Research Drive as well. The uh, Zoning Commission and staff recommended this property is annexed. It should become an SF10 district uh, based on SF10 being the closest equivalent zone to what the property is currently zoned in the county. And just a note again that the final action on this item will occur as part of the motion to approve or deny the petition for annexation. Are there any questions of staff on this Mr. Herman, did you say if this was in the MIA or not? Oh, I'm sorry, I did not. But this is in the MIA. Um, this is north on Claude, uh, off of Claude Lee from where the other property was we just looked at. Are there additional questions for staff at this time? Yes. Okay, sir, stand by. We'll, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Cruz. No, I'll wait till after the hearing, Mr. Mayor. Okay, sir. We'll open the public here, ma'am. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, our first speaker is Mr. Dell Crawford. I'm Dale Crawford, uh, Crawford Design Company, 116 uh, North Cool Spring Street, Fayetteville. Uh, our, I am representing the owner, and I'll be brief on the rezoning. Um, my client is certainly in favor of the rezoning if the annexation goes through, so I'll hold further comments until the public hearing for the uh, annexation, but uh, he would be in favor of this zoning. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Yes. Thank you for coming, sir. Sir, I have no further speakers for this okay. item. We'll close the public hearing and entertain questions. Mr. Bates, did you have one, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Crawford. Um, so you're saying you're the, the, the architect engineer for this? Yes, sir. We're the civil engineer for it. Um, where do you plan on doing the stormwater runoff? What's your plan to mitigate stormwater runoff? According to my understanding, we can... Uh, design and develop this according to the standards of the county and the county at this time does not have actual BMPs because this has a vested rights that uh, was continued back when the county had uh, we had developed it back in okay, 2007. But, okay but now if, if we annex it into the city you'll have to meet city standards in our stormwater that's something that it's, I guess Mr. Harmon can speak on or somebody else can speak on, but we did meet with the TRC, and it's my understanding that we can develop per county standards. Mr. That's Harmon. That's Mr. Shu, uh, Shuford to come up, <coughs> Keith. I think okay. he's, he's got some uh, current information on that question. Mr. Bates, the, yes, uh, this property is um, part of a larger development um, uh, portion which has been constructed and um, it was uh, started prior to uh, July of 2007 when the county's phase two stormwater requirements went into effect mm -hmm. and uh, because of its uh, continuation of an existing plan it has the potential uh, depending upon how the annexation uh, decisions are made uh, to um, uh, be developed uh, with uh, them installing a, a stormwater facility to start with to control erosion issues, complete the development, and then uh, be able to remove that uh, temporary stormwater pond. So the intent behind that is to, to manage the, uh, the sediment and erosion that would occur as the site's developed, and then later on uh, <clears throat> address any uh, stormwater uh, management through uh, they probably will have some swells or other ways to direct the water to go to the right place okay so they don't have to do curb and gutters I, I think City it's standards. their intention to to install quite a bit of, of uh, infrastructure to city standards but I don't know the details of that and I would ask uh, 
Mr. Crawford to come back up and, and talk to you about uh, the overall site design for this project, if that's the question. Okay, so, okay, before we get to that, though, make sure I'm clear. They Do they or do they not have to build the city standards? You're saying they're like grandfathered in or well, something? Uh, may we better back up? The, right. the application for this uh, annexation came in three days before your policy change became effective. And the so, UDO change? The, uh, the UDO? Actually, your, your policy with regard to how we uh, annex. Annex and rezone. And so um, from that standpoint, they're not technically required uh, to, uh, to comply with all city standards because that was not what uh, the, the policy required at the time that they applied for uh, annexation. Hmm. Why don't we okay. uh, invite Mr. Crawford back up and ask some questions about what exactly is in planned and can we do that, Mr. Bates? Mr. Crawford, can you come up and uh, outline the plans as it relates to the city, uh, city standards that would plan be planned for in this project? Absolutely. Uh, what my client's intent is and what we've designed is uh, most of the city standards will be complied with. 27 foot back to back, uh, pavement, curb and gutter. Uh, utilities per PWC standards and things of that nature. And if you've ever been out to Lakeside at Snow Hill, the, um, which is outside of the county right now, and this is the phase two of that, I think you'll find that it's really close to uh, to the city standards. About sidewalks, Mr. Crawford. Sidewalks, uh, at least on one side, if not both sides, but at least on one side. So, uh, again, I think you'll find that it's uh, it's much it's much more than just uh, side ditches and things of that nature. Okay, be a nice development. you know, with that wetland down on the south bottom part, I just you know, was there a plan y'all going to dump storm you know the storm water run off into that um, wetlands and then everybody downstream is going to get flooded out? And again, we would comply, or my client would comply with all the uh, requirements that are in place. That he needs to uh, comply with. All right, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Applewhite and the Metro here. Um, Mr. Schuford, you, you use the term, um, you mentioned phase, the county's standards, and then you said later on um, that the developer would fix it, <laughs> their, run, their water runoff. They'd have a certain certain amount of time to control sediments during development, and then later on, what does later on mean? Well, I'm What's glad you asked that question because it's uh, it's been a kind of a steep learning curve for me this afternoon to learn about all these different uh, uh, county uh, standards. But the the way the the uh, it works is that um, you would have the uh, developer install a, a sediment trapping pond at the outset of the development. And that pond would stay in place until the uh, area was, uh, the construction was through and it was seeded over and the, the stormwater management system that they would put into place um, that uh, again, Mr. Crawford would be able to better describe uh, would, would take effect. And then that sediment pond would go away, it would be able to be uh, developed or used in some other fashion. Okay, so Mr. Crawford, so what's the time frame? Uh, you know, I'm wondering, is this like four years down the road, or it, what makes you move forward with closing up that sediment pond, you know? Certainly. Uh, what my client intends to do, and uh, he thought he could go ahead and proceed because what happened is my understanding, you know, uh, he did petition for annexation back in 2005 and the city didn't act on it. So he's doing phase one and other phases and things like this. And so uh, we have the project designed. Again, it's, it's, it's um, fully designed and uh, permitted mm -hmm. and all. So he's, uh, with exception of negotiating uh, prices and things for the actual development, he's, he's pretty much ready to go. So the only thing that I'm start. trying to get on is you, you keep saying what your client intends to do what I'm yes, trying to figure out what the rules are that he has to adhere to versus what he intends to do it does do the rules say when you get the opportunity to are the are the rules say within six months what, what triggers taking the yeah retention pond out I guess is yeah that, what triggers that yes uh, North Carolina Department of, of uh, Environmental and Natural Resources has specific requirements 
on erosion and sedimentation. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you certainly cannot erode uh, areas. You certainly cannot uh, put sediment in streams. So there are protective measures that are put in place during construction. And once that project is built out, then as those, then as the uh, ground cover grows, the streets are put in, then some of those measures are taken away as long as they have proper ground cover and proper measures in place so they won't have long-term effects. <coughs> uh, but uh, the North Carolina Department of Transport, excuse me, the North Carolina Department of Envir Environmental Health and Natural Resources is the ones that makes that decision okay. when those measures are taken out. Okay. So there are protection during construction and after construction. So and one question for Ms. McDonald. Um, I'm a little confused on county and city. Can we just say as a condition of this, of approving this, that they just meet city standards and forget all of this other stuff and just say, we want you make that a condition of it. They meet the, this, our current stormwater requirements, regardless of what the county says. Can we do that? We can't? Ms. Applewhite, I don't think you can place that condition okay. be because it is just a rezoning and not a conditional rezoning. Okay. Um, so the short answer is I don't think council can do so that. I'm, I'm, and I'm understanding the state has the um, last say, but I'm still not here in time frame, but that, that's okay. Thank you. Mr. Hare. Uh, Ms. McDonough, I'm going to uh, continue to follow. I thought, I thought we had it when I heard uh, Councilwoman Applewhite ask about the conditions, so I thought we had it. But since this is coming into the city, we can't make a requirement? I mean, I mean if it's coming into the city, doesn't it just fall on up under the city standards, sidewalks, curbs, gutters? on and on not a part not as a part of this process um, as uh, mr. Schufert or mr. Harmon alluded to you have some um, as part of your policy you have made some changes that require that they meet certain standards <clears throat> however this application was presented before you changed your policy Okay. So essentially, um, they came in right before your change. Okay, dokie. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. McDonald, recognizing we're talking about a rezoning question now, and later there's an annexation question, um, what kind of flexibility does council have when we get to that second question about the annexation, if you accept annexation or not? And does, do you have more flexibility in having requirements associated with that? Um, the manager would like to respond to that question. Okay. I think we'll have some additional information. Uh, there wouldn't be necessarily the opportunity to condition, uh, but there is an opportunity regarding timing that would impact the outcome of the project and how it moves forward. So, so that's that's information we can provide during the annexation have process. Some tools to potentially, uh, Mr. Arp. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Crawford. Um, I just I want to make sure that I understand there were some good questions by, by fellow council members tonight. Uh, the city standard versus the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources standard, which, which has that greater standard in, in a development like this, Diener or the city? <coughs> the city has the more stringent standard. Okay. But, but with the, with the Diener standard, and this property, in the, in the satellite photograph here, there's trees. I, I would assume it's been, it's been cleared at this point? The lots, um, there's a significant amount of this that will remain in trees. Okay. Because there are some environmental sensitive areas, that kind of thing. So, but no, it has not been clear cut um, or anything. It hadn't been, de been developed except for phase one. Okay, so, so my, my point, though, is when you go in and you begin the clearing process, then you begin the erosion control process, which is both wind and water, as I understand it. Is that correct? That's correct. A and you will have to have sedimentation fencing. You will have to have temporary sediment traps. You will have to have different control measures that, to, to meet the state standard of control runoff to ensure sediment doesn't enter that wetland. Is that correct? That is correct. What, what are the penalties like with the Department of Environmental well, Natural? pretty stiff. 
Pretty <laughs> stiff. Pretty stiff if you fail to comply. Pretty significant if you if you do not maintain those measures um, and things of that nature. So that, how, how frequently does the state inspect? Pretty frequently. They inspect pretty frequently. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, and on the temporary sediment trap. Deaner will approve your, your erosion control plan, is that correct? That is correct. And they will approve your timeline for implementation of sediment control measures and removal of sediment control measures based That's on certain decision points? That is correct. Um, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Sure. Mr. Fowler? I have a question for, I have a question for Mr. Schubert. In looking at the, uh, the process of annexing this and looking at the value uh, Will the annexation uh, of this property provide enough revenue to provide the services required out there? Um, Mr. Fowler, I can't answer that because uh, I'm going to have to defer that to Mr. David Nash, and, and that's a great question to ask during the annexation part of this when he'll be but before you. Um, okay. While I'm here, though, I wouldn't mind adding one more a bit of clarification about this uh, stormwater issue. This project started back in 2005, <clears throat> and the, the changes to the stormwater regulations that impacted the county didn't come into effect until mid-2007. So this being a, 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 a sequential phase, uh, it was in effect approved as part of that um, uh, original um, uh, uh, 2005 uh, project. So I don't know if that helps uh, explain it. and I. I it, they uh, they followed the process uh, to to get uh, sewer that uh, you had in place uh, to petition. Uh, apparently, it never reached the uh, uh, the city council for a decision. But uh, and why that's the case, I, I don't have a, a clue. But uh, you um, uh, you basically have a, uh, this piece uh, coming in before you with the potential for being annexed. I'm sorry, I can't answer oh, that's, your question. That's fine. But then, as a follow-up to that, then also, then what you're saying is, is that this property could be developed under the same Diener standards and everything else, and remain in the county, without being a part of the city. Yes, you know, sir. It could be developed just the way that. Well, it it, 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 uh, it would have to be developed. Uh, well, I, I believe it could be developed just the way it would be uh, uh, under the county, because I'm remembering your old policy, which gave you the. Uh, uh, ability to uh, all they needed to do was to petition and then they could develop under county standards mm -hmm. okay mr. Bates yes sir um, Schiffer, let me see if I have this right because now we're we're talking about three different issues I think the city requires stormwater control runoff the county does not because they opted out of stormwater phase two whatever requirements I think that's what it was called phase two stormwater requirements well well they, they actually have to th their phase two requirements went into effect uh, July 1 2007 mm -hmm. so the, the county does have a standard of uh, uh, holding uh, the first one inch of rainfall and I don't know what the design storm is um, on site uh, with a pond uh, the city standards, I think, are more stringent, but we do require a pond, and, and they do too now. Prior to that, uh, the county standards were, were less restrictive and uh, were more directed at uh, uh, addressing the sediment and erosion issues. Yeah, and, and Diener just requires during the construction phase um, sediment and erosion control uh during the development construction phase and once I guess they get their certificate of occupancy or stamp of approval they're done and it says grass grows the storm uh, the curb and gutter is running we know where the water is going then they can do away with the sediment pond but the city when you have your retention pond you don't cover up the retention pond that, that's correct sir and and uh, the if it was developed uh, according to city standards uh, ultimately the city would assume maintenance for those uh, ponds Okay, well, I'm, say, I, I'm just trying to figure out, see that if they don't run everything into that stream and then everybody downstream starts getting flooded out, even though they're in the I county, understand. we're going to end up out there at backhoes trying to clean. And uh, All right, thank you, sir. And, and just to, to reiterate, I believe the standard that, uh, that they were approved to is a water quality standard, but not a water quantity standard, which is what you're getting at. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you. Any additional questions? 
Okay, again, this is the first part of a process. Is there a motion on the floor for item 6.2? Mr. Mayor, sir, I move we approve the rezoning request. Okay, Mr. As Fowler, petitioned. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Any discussion on the motion? What was? We, I didn't hear it clearly. Mr. I'm sorry. To approve the rezoning to an yep. SF10. <coughs> thank you. Any questions on that? And if you vote, please. Okay. That motion carries as in favor, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Arp, Ms. Davey, Mr. Massey, Mr. Fowler, in opposition, Mr. Criff and Mr. Hare. Okay, we'll move now to item 6.3, which is item P1218F. Next uh, zoning case we have before you tonight is another initial zoning. Uh, the request is to go from an R15 district in the county to SF10 uh, single family in the city. Property is located at 6342 and 6346 Caveson Court. Uh, it's just under a half acre uh, total. On the uh, aerial map, um, the property that's actually in question is only this little area uh, in yellow in the very corner here. Um, what we have is the develop, uh, a, a developer that owns this uh, larger track also owns uh, the remaining part of this. And we have two very unusually shaped uh, lots here on Caveson Court. Uh, this bigger track is outside of the city currently. Everything else is inside the city. Uh, they're looking to get that little piece uh, annexed into the city and then they would split uh, that property in two and part would go to this property and part would go to this property to basically square them off and make them a more more both more regularly shaped lots um, This particular one uh, does take advantage of the City Council's new policy on annexations uh, In the past we had gone always gone straight with or the policy called for us to go straight from the closest uh, zoning district in the county to the closest thing in the city. Uh, in this case, the larger property is R15 in the county. Uh, the developed subdivision here is SF10. Since this is being added to an SF10 subdivision, it only seems logical that if annexed that that should become SF10 property as well. Um, as you can see from the aerial, um, the as you could tell a while ago, the bigger property here uh, is undeveloped, mostly single family residential, or that's all that surrounds this property at this point. Uh, the two properties this uh, potential annexation would affect are right here. And the land use plan also calls for single family or low density residential uh, throughout this area with some. Uh, conservation areas along the creekways uh, as well. The Zoning Commission and staff recommend that if the property is annexed it should become SF10. Uh, <laughs> based on SF10 as a zoning district for the rest of the subdivision that this property will be added to. And again, just as a reminder, the final action on this item will occur as part of the motion to approve or deny the petition for annexation. Are there any questions of staff on this particular project not at this time sir thank you madam clerk uh, we have no speakers for this okay item. we'll uh, close the public hearing and entertain any additional questions from staff or a motion mr bates sir a motion to approve okay i have a motion second. to approve and a second by mr chris is there any discussion on that council hearing none let me ask for your vote on that motion please <coughs> that is unanimous thank you We'll move now to item 6.4, which I believe is a continuation of item 6.3. Mr. Nash, perhaps you can walk us through this process. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> um, tonight you have three annexation public hearings, which mirror the three initial zoning public hearings you just heard. Um, the notice of the public hearing was published on 
uh, April 13th in the Fayetteville Observer. Um, just a special note about this policy we're going through tonight for the first time in which we're doing the initial zoning part first and then the um, annexation hearing. Uh, that's based on the change you made on February 13th. Um, two of these areas has been brought out. The Young property and Lakeside at Snow Hill were submitted uh, before the change on February 13th. Um, but all three have been scheduled as if we're going through the new process as it's envisioned. <clears throat> Um, the first area tonight, um, just some information on the Greystone Farms. We're kind of working in reverse order from the way Craig just presented them. Um, this is contiguous to the city, um, all very small size, about 0.45 acres. On this map, you can see Greystone Farms there in yellow. And as Craig's already pointed out, it's just a tiny corner of a piece that is surrounded on three sides by Greystone Farms. And all this is located just north of the I-295 um, <clears throat> highway. <clears throat> um, no real issues here. We checked it out. It's sufficient. It's owned by the persons who signed it, Mr. Don Broadwell and Mr. Charles Weber. No problems with services. It's such a small area. <clears throat> and so in this case, the staff has recommended approval. Are there any questions at this point before your public hearing? Any questions for Mr. Nash? All right, sir. Stand by. Ma'am, we'll open the public hearing. So we have no speakers. For okay, this we'll item. close the public hearing. Any uh, entertaining any additional questions or a motion from council? Mr. Bates? Yes, sir. Make a motion to approve the annexation ordinance effective April 23rd, 2012. Second. Right, I have a second by Mr. Hare. Any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> Let me ask for your vote, please. Did you have something, Ms. McGonagall? As part of this process, you need to make sure you actually <coughs> reconfirm your zoning decision as part of this action. So it's to annex and to zone this property as SF10. Is that okay, uh, yes, sir. Mr. Bates? Is that Motion okay, Mr. Hare? Approve the SF10 and annexation effective April 23rd, 2012. Okay, by clear on that. All right. Let me uh, let's just take another vote real quick, just to be on the safe side. Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay, Mr. Nash, let's look at 6.5. Okay, this is one back to Lakeside at Snow Hill Phase 2. Again, it's a satellite annexation petition located south of the airport, about 20, 27 acres. The land is currently vacant. Now, on this map, uh, you can see where the existing city is because it's <coughs> zoomed out far enough. You see the fairly large property there north of this area that's the Fayetteville Regional Airport. The area uh, that is being proposed here as phase two of Lakeside is in a gray area uh, with red dots around it to try to highlight it. And it's all north of I-95 I and north of Rockfish Creek, kind of close to, as Mr. Herman said, the county industrial park. Um, something this map maybe is a little out of place, but I'll go ahead and point out that it is located almost directly underneath the flight line of the Fayetteville Regional Airport. Um, the site here, the boundaries of it are shown in a light green line, and the arrow is pointing into the area that would be developed as phase two. That yellow shaded area is the so-called outer safety area of the airport that's been designated off of the ends of the runways. That's actually in place in the county zoning ordinance. Here's just a map of the property boundaries. Now a couple photos of Lakeside at Snow Hill. This is looking down um, Snow Hill Road towards the west. And the part that's already been built with about 68 lots is there on the left side of the road. The entrance, the entrance. This is looking down the main entrance into the part that's already been developed. Uh, you can see that sidewalks were built at least on one side of the street here. Uh, another shot of the interior of what's already been built. Unfortunately, this was not brought into the city in 2005 when they petitioned for it to be annexed. Several issues have arisen here. Uh, sufficiency is okay. It's owned by Mr. Sean Dasani and the corporation named Lakeside at Snow Hill. Uh, it does appear to meet the satellite annexation standards. Those are outlined in the ordinance that's in your materials. 
Um, in terms of services, the police department has expressed some concern about service delivery here. Um, fiscal impact is rather hard to assess because the police get <coughs> a very large number, uh, but it's hard to break it out into various years. Um, again, phase one was not annexed earlier. Um, and again, has been brought out already. The initial zoning in terms of that this petition for annexation was submitted three days prior to your policy change. Airport, airport compatibility has already been covered briefly in that slide I showed you. Um, there are three options as outlined in your memo. Um, one is to adopt the ordinance with the effective date as of tonight. Secondly, adopt the ordinance with a delayed effective date. And as a satellite, <laughs> you can go out and delay it as long as six months from tonight that would put you out to october 23rd third options do not annex the area and mr fowler had asked about i guess the revenue versus costs um if you make some assumptions about how fast this area might build out and i did that in a spreadsheet uh it looks like the five-year revenues would be up to about one hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars spread out over five years. Assuming they started building next month and build about three houses per month and they would have it built in 13 months. And all the revenues that go along with that population. It's also based on the uh, same values in phase one for real property values, land buildings, and extra features. Um, I really cannot put those cost figures that we receive from the departments into the spreadsheet at this point because we just don't have enough detail um, on how they would shake out per year um, they gave me a little more information than what you have in your packet and it actually indicates the cost per officer we're talking police cost here uh, were even higher than what had been used originally uh, they were estimating that to annex this area it tips the scales completely causing them to need five new officers and all of those officers would need new vehicles. Uh, the total cost was about 450,000. Um, and it would be even a little bit more based on the newer figures. But sir, we just cannot put them into the spreadsheet year by year accurately at this point. Uh, you would be addressing the police department's needs, I'm sure, in future budget years as they come to you and tell you that we've been annexing and that we're putting them in a somewhat of a bind the problem with this area if there is a problem is that it is located fairly far away from the city but not as far as the next area that you'll be seeing hmm. in the public hearing mr Nash, let me ask a question because this is one of those that you know is moving before law change in the whole nine yards but the law that was in place the ordinance that was in place before the council adopted the most recent ordinance if someone petitioned for annexation into the city i'm just a little bit confused about this if they petitioned for annexation into the city did that mean they could get water and sewer just the act of petitioning would get them water and sewer prior to that last modification that we did or, or help me understand that a little better i believe it did i was not working with this that much back then but um mr bauer do you know if that's the case sir that is the case your honor so yeah no just <laughs> so um if someone before we change our ordinance just to make sure because i think this is caught up in that it is one of those weird ones that's why we changed it was that someone could apply for it and just the mere fact that they petitioned for annexation would allow them to get water and sewer without yep. annexation that's necessary. correct you had the option to your policy simply stated that they were required to petition so council could have taken action and said we will not annex the property but they would still be eligible to receive water and sewer. That is, was part is of that the possibly what was going on even five years ago when we believe the property owner petitioned and the council didn't hear it and they were able to get water and sewer. Is that what we think happened then? We don't know. Okay. Well, what I've heard actually was that the staff was concerned about development in the flight path. And they thought that by not moving forward on it, they might be able to prevent the development from moving forward. That's what I've heard. Okay. This is confusing. Uh, yeah, we don't. Do you have a question, ma'am? 
Um, in regards to the police department's concern, um, was it just the cost, as you mentioned, of the additional officers and, and um, you know, what it would cost to hire that, or was it the ability to deliver service to an area or combination of both? It's a combination of both. They pointed out that we've had a few other annexations out US 301 in the last six months, mm -hmm. not very large ones, but uh, and then these two that you have before you tonight are out in that direction. I just think that they felt like that zone that serves that part of town was getting too extended. And with we're talking about 28 acres, approximately how many home, how big would that subdivision be? How many additional homes? I think this part was going to have 39 lots. So 39 additional homes. Right. And the phase that's already been built, I believe, had 60A, a total of about 107, 108 lots. Okay. And, and my last question, and I'm kind of confused as well, because we did clarify that this is in the MIA. So I think my understanding of the MIA is that these areas would be built to city standards. Right. So if that is the intent of the MIA, and they are in the MIA, but then we're going to allow them to, and I don't want to beat up on that last issue, but then we're going to allow them to build the development and perhaps have different standards in terms of stormwater? I think staff might have an answer for that. Thank you for the question, Council Member Applewhite. Actually, under the MIA, before uh, Council's change in policy, development in the MIA m could move forward under the county, and the county had agreed to apply a subsection of our standards, including the sidewalk standard, Okay. and the street and uh, street standard basically <coughs> so most of our standards that were approved through the new development regulation last year would not apply under the MIA agreement that <coughs> was adopted it's really your change in policy in the last couple of months that has triggered the potential for uh, a more rigorous application of the city standards in those areas okay that's good thank you and might I add that um, the cases tonight are not really good ones to get an experience with this new policy because this one had its plans approved by the county Before. years ago. Well, we're doing, uh, it seems like we're dealing with a lot of these that are kind of in the transition. They right. started before law ordinances changed. Ms. McDonald, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about the rezoning initially and, and you heard several council members uh, trying to explore what kind of flexibility we might have and it didn't seem like we had any then. Do we have any flexibility as it relate to the annexation to speak to the standards that council is interested in seeing and put in? There's a debate about that. That's why um, I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the council is really very limited. Um, that is certainly the most conservative approach. Certainly a um, less conservative approach would be to adopt the um, annexation ordinance and make it effective immediately, which would uh, then trigger them having to get their permits from the city. Um, but the more conservative pr approach is that we are using our previous standard, and so we would not have those options available to us. I would also point out that um, this is phase two of a subdivision, and so you will be, this petition only pertains to phase two, so phase one will remain out of the city subject to some initiation of an uh, voluntary city uh, initiated annexation or some other petition. So if we were to vote to approve the annexation, can someone kind of spell out exactly what that would mean tonight? Just to make sure we're all clear, because this is pretty confusing, really. The development would occur, would it be on sidewalks, it would be on curb and gutter, it would have a short-term retention pond, yes. not a long-term one? Yes. Would we, can you identify the other differences? If we were to approve the annexation tonight, can we identify the differences that would happen because of the timing of this one versus if it were just a, a normal one that we might do next month or a, you know one that didn't get caught up in the time frame? Would there be differences other than the retention pond? 
um, under our current standards, other than attention span, as, as I mentioned earlier, the standards they'd be feeling or dealing with are water quality standards, not water quantity standards. So they'd be dealing with erosion control rather than uh, retention moving forward. The other one would be sidewalks. Uh, they have a, basically a permissive standard. I mean, they've said that they're going to put in sidewalks, but they're not necessarily required to put in sidewalks. I think the county would hopefully enforce one side of the street, which is the part of the MIA that was agreed to. So they would at least see those, whereas our current regulation is both sides of the street. There may be some other standards that apply to the layout of lots. But if we if we did an annexation tonight, they wouldn't be required. Doesn't that re bring a requirement for sidewalks? For sidewalks on one side of the street. On one side per, of the street. So, per the MIA. So, not, so not we would be guaranteed there'd be sidewalks on one side of the street. There would be curb and gutter. Would would be, we be guaranteed of that? And our street standards would be complied with. And I think it's all part of, as uh, the engineer said, part of their design. Okay. Um, those are the, the main uh, differences. I think you've identified those accurately. <clears throat> Okay, we have another question. Ms. Applewhite, sorry, ma'am. One last question. Councilmember Bates and I are <laughs> have a little sidebar here. Is it a standard, say, because our police department has expressed concerns about being able to service and the cost, do we have a, a procedure where we pay the county sheriff's department to, to, uh, to service them with law enforcement? Is that what, would that be an option or have we done that before? I'm not aware of that, of course. None of the county taxes that go to provide uh, sheriff services are abated. So they continue to contribute the same amount of money toward that protection that they do before they're annexed. So it's the police, our police department or... or our police department would be the primary call. There certainly would be a mutual aid uh, in place. So we're thinking about, what was this, Baywood? Subdivision Baywood that we brought in? And our police department goes out there? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. They would at least get the call. Okay. Ms. Crisp. Uh, Mr. Nash, you, did you just show us some pictures of the entranceway to the lakeside? Yes, sir. Are those sidewalks on both sides or one side? Um, just one? At this, on this picture here, it's on the right side, but further down, I believe it's actually on both, both sides. sides. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the streets in phase one. There it's on both. Like right there, have sidewalks on both sides. But Mr. Crawford <laughs> said... They're going to build sidewalks on one side in phase two. Did I understand that correctly? Um, he That's what you said, Mr. Crawford? Yes, sir. At a minimum, they're going to build a sidewalk on one side. At a minimum. I'm well, not sure if they're going to build a sidewalk on both sides. Right now, they are going to build a sidewalk on one side. Yes, sir. What you built, did, were you responsible for the development of Lakeside phase one? Excuse this me. One? The one that's on the yes, screen. Yes, sir. We did the design work for phase one also. But you built sidewalks on both sides there for the convenience of the residents. Actually, the client, I think, put those in after we did the design work. That was put in actually by the builders themselves, mm -hmm. uh, extended by the builders themselves, <clears throat> and not actually a part of our construction documents. But, yes, sir, there are sidewalks mainly on one side, but there are some sidewalks on you know, on both sides of the street. But in this case, phase two would just be one side, at a minimum. I got a problem with that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions? Sorry, any other questions? I want to make sure we summarize and get this, because this is a very confusing one. We're given an option of an annexation, <coughs> which has some pieces on it that we might not necessarily like in the absence of that because this came in under a previous ordinance they could get water and sewer and not come into the city I mean, are those the two options that we have or not do it at all well not doing it all means they could get water and sewer and not come into the city am i reading that wrong right that's what i understand all right is that correct miss mcdonough Yes. Okay. Any other any additional questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Chris. Uh, Mr. Nash, don't run, sir. Um, my understanding, the nearest fire department is about 2.2 .2 miles from Lakeside Phase One, right? Peace Mill. Right, Pierce's Mill. Now, how will they get into that Phase Two? Obviously, there will be connectors between phase one and two. Right. 
So the fire department would go in through Lakeside Phase 1 yes, to get to homes in Phase 2. And if this goes through, that would be contract with Peace Mill because we don't have. But Chief, 2.2 uh, miles is outside our response time, isn't it? Come on up, Chief. We don't hear from you sometime. Enough. Come on up to begin the mic. Mm -hmm. Councilman Chris, our closest station would be six miles from that location, so we would contract with Pierce's Mill uh, Fire Department. The city's station would be six. Now, Peace Mill at 2.2 .2 miles, they can still respond within the optimum time, five minutes or more or less? Yes, sir. A, a good estimate is uh, two minutes uh, per mile. Okay. So that would put it about a five-minute response. About a five-minute response. All right, thank you so much. And we pay per call? Mm -mm. No, sir. We would do a, a service contract, a full service contract with Pierce's Mill mm -hmm. to provide uh, fire protection coverage and, and uh, EMS coverage. So the, the other concern, and you can't handle this one, Chief. Thank you anyway, Mr. Nash. I got great concerns about our police department being able to respond that far out. Currently, phase one of Lakeside is handled by the county. Mr. Mayor. In the county. Ma'am. I'm, I'm very sorry, but uh, we didn't open the public hearing. Right. And so that was the phase for asking questions, if we could open the public hearing. Right. And Hold that, Mr. Chris. I thought there was no, no we, we haven't uh, We haven't done this we one yet. We didn't open it? No. We were just asking questions. Just had a lot of them. Yeah. We're getting ready to. <coughs> Open the public here, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we just have one speaker for this okay. item, Mr. Del Crawford. Mr. Crawford? <laughs> All right, Mr. Crawford, just sit right there. Any questions? Uh -huh. <laughs> no. Uh, I'll be brief uh, and certainly appreciate the dialogue back and forth. This is a, this is a hard decision. I, I understand for the council, this is a hard decision for my client and all. I don't know what happened back in 2004, 2005. Uh, I will clarify something. It was not just phase one that was petitioned for annexation. It was this track also. So again, I want to be really clear to everyone. It was the entire development that was petitioned for annexation. For whatever reason, it wasn't acted on. And now we're back to square one with another petition for annexation on the same property that was petitioned before. So I. I hope you all can understand the confusion with my client because all we wanted to do is, or they wanted to do is develop the site, develop to, to a certain standard. Certainly if it came in with the uh, with city standards, they developed the city standards, but it didn't at that time. Again, I don't know what happened with the city, why they didn't, uh, why they didn't go ahead and proceed with the petition, but in, in any case they didn't. But uh, it was the entire track and not, uh, not just the parcel track. With that said, um, my client, you know, certainly is opposed to the annexation. Uh, if it goes through, you know, he certainly understands, but they are opposed to it for obvious reasons um, and all. Uh, I do think it's a concern, me being a taxpayer, concerned with what I hear, you know, all these costs to annex this and to maintain it being, what, five or six miles outside the city limits. Also, going through the county on a phase one, going into a phase two to be in the city, it, it does pose some problems. So on a personal note, you know, I'd be opposed to it. But uh, if you do uh, choose to annex, we certainly would uh, appreciate to avoid any additional confusion mm -hmm. is to allow them to, um, you know, once they build the homes, and I think we've already made the decisions mm -hmm. on the uh, actual development being to county standards, mm -hmm. but once they, uh, construct the homes that they would be allowed to uh, go through the county building permit process and not the city to avoid any more confusion. But I'll certainly, you know, ask, uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you, sir. Sure. We'll close the uh, public hearing and entertain any additional questions, Mr. Bates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Crawford, um, I guess this would go for city manager or city attorney. So I just want to make sure that I'm on the all this info is getting digested. Um, if we approve, then city standards, PwC, water and sewer, and they build and all that good stuff. If we disapprove, they build 
and they're in the county, but they still build and they have PWC sewer and water and we receive nothing out of it. That's essentially correct. Of course, if you do approve, then again, currently they are vested under city, I mean, county standards. So not all of the city standards would apply. Uh, but it is a, really a question about whether they develop in the city uh, under their current approvals or whether they develop in the county under their current approvals. Yeah. All right, thank you. And for the um, chief majors, do you know how much it would cost to contract with Pierce's Mill? About how much yeah. it's going to cost for us to contract with the, the fire department to cover it? Yeah, 97000 I don't currently have uh, that, that data. Uh, because it's, uh, well, it's based on um, property valuations, tax valuations. Currently, there's no um, development there. Of course, future years, uh, the cost would increase. Mm -hmm. Well, then, how did they figure, Mr. Nash, or somebody brought up that it was going to be like 178,000 in taxes over five years? So, how do y'all figure that? We don't know what the houses are valued at, and I mean. The, the, in this particular case, it's a little easier to project the revenues if we assume that we annex it than it is to project the costs. <coughs> you, know, you just have to decide how fast you think the homes will get built and apply the values that are in phase one to them. And then there are sales tax factors that you put into it per capita. You assume how many people live in each home. Um, so, Power bill revenue has to be factored in, which is based on both street miles and population. Um, those things are done fairly routinely in our... Okay, okay. then, Chief, if when one house is built and sold and just say a childless couple moves in, okay, so there's only two people living in the house, it doesn't matter how many live in the house, it's the value of the house, of that one house that we're going to have to pay Pierce's Mill to cover, to buy coverage for, and then... As the years or the months go by and there's two, three, four, five houses that are occupied, the price keeps going up. That is correct. It's the, the cost, uh, tax value of the home mm -hmm. itself, and also um, personal property uh, is figured into that. Okay. Now, if I think we've been looking to put a firehouse out there on Cedar Creek somewhere. Um, you know, it might be five years or ten years down the road, but just it does. Would that new fire department, if it was out by the 295 or 95 Cedar Creek interchange, would that be able to cover this? I think we would still end up contracting with Chris's <coughs> Mill, which would have a closer response. All right, thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Mr. Fowler. Mr. Crawford. Hmm. Just want to make sure I heard you. Uh, correctly is that the owner actually opposes the annexation of the property is that correct that's correct yes sir. so if I'm if I'm understanding it uh, then the purpose for uh, for requesting the annexation was simply to make sure that there could be PWC water and sewer there that's correct okay uh, hold on Mr. Crawford we just were told by our attorney and our city manager that because this came under a previous policy that just the mere act of petitioning for that's what I'm saying that that's that that's the purpose for the order. petition right was so that they could do that in the hopes that it would be opposed and, and not voted in as annexed and, and that's still, the same as it was in 2005 still, I understand it was still get the PwC water into it yeah and but I just was looking for the motive behind the petition and I think we found it all right thanks any additional questions yeah. okay how about a motion mr. mayor uh, make a motion to um, to approve option one, and that's to adopt the annexation orders with an effective date of April 23rd, 2012. I have a motion from Mr. Arp. Is there a second to the motion? I'm sorry. Got it. someone from Ms. McDonald. Or? The motion will also need to um, include the zoning. To include a zoning of uh, SF10. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Hurst. Is there a discussion on the motion? All right, Mr. Fowler. Sir, I, the, the big concern I have on this is that, that we incur costs beyond what it will take to provide the services. And I understand there's some concern about being played to say, hey, they're going to get sewer and water because they're doing this. 
and you know we could say okay we'll foil their plans by going ahead and annexing them and then they're going to be stuck with that but we're going we could be stuck with an expense that we simply are going to have to to sp spread that uh that additional expense or bearing that burden to the the current citizens of the of the city of Fayetteville and uh I'm a little loath to add additional cost on the onto those citizens in this respect so I just wanted to to make those comments known to the council Ms. Applewhite. And if I could follow up on your same thought process. Right now, we're, um, we've heard briefings from the chief of police saying we need X number of police just to meet the needs of the city of Fayetteville. And we're, we're toying around with how much that is going to cost us for our existing land. So now we hear that this uh, subdivision that's, you know, dislocated from the, the, the body of the city and they will need perhaps four or five, we can't provide police support for what we have. So I'm not going to support this. Thank you. Massey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one of the things that David Nash indicated was that as this entire project is evolving, resources are going to be made available. As people move in, pay taxes, whatever the case might be. So it's not as if in other words, everybody else from the city is going to be paying for police protection here, there, or whatever the case might be. He did indicate that it would depend upon the speed of the evolution. Now, the question there becomes, do we limit ourselves? I hear what both uh, uh, you and uh, Councilman are saying about putting this on everybody, but by the very same token, uh, is this in our municipal influence area? Is this a part of the growth process? And is this the price we pay to grow? I don't know. If we if we don't want to uh, share that, I fully understand. But by the very same token, uh, just look at both sides of it. Mr. Bates. Um, Mr. Shuford, do you know if there's any more of these that were snuck in under the wire? or submit it just before the, the cutoff deadline? Uh, Mr. Bates, that's probably a better question for Mr. Nash, but uh, I'm looking at him and uh, we don't think, uh, we think this is the last grouping that uh, would uh, would fall into that category. Right, uh, you may still have some of the same um, uh, service issues, uh, mm -hmm. even if they are built entirely to our standards, stormwater and everything else mm -hmm. uh, that you would need to consider. but. Uh, there again, it um, has been mentioned. It is a um, uh, a growth issue, and uh, we've sort of defined where our growth boundaries are through the MIA. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saying I, I like the way we're this process better than the old process. So we're. Uh, Mr. Chris. Uh, Mr. May, if I may comment very briefly, I think we've had numerous discussions based on the Big Bang with regards to. Phase five whether or not it should have been done on a smaller scale because of the ability or inability to provide adequate services. Here we are again with a bridge this far, and our police have said that this will be an, a stretch, a burden. And I'm just opposed in annexation where we can't provide adequate services to those people that we're talking about in annexing. Thank you. All right, sir. I think that's everybody. Anybody else? Okay. The mo I'm sorry. Everybody. The motion uh, adopt the annexation ordinance effective date of April 23rd uh, SF10 uh, zoning. May I ask you a vote on that motion, please? Okay. That motion fails. Uh, those in let's see, vote in favor of the motion: Mr. Terse, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Art, Mr. Massey. In opposition: Mr. Chris, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Ms. Davey, Mr. Hare, and Mr. Fowler. Okay. We'll move now to item 6.6, .6, which is uh, public hearing concerning the Young property. That's why we did with 2005. Bear with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Young property is the third annexation hearing tonight. Uh, you've heard from Mr. Harmon half an hour ago on the zoning part of this. 
On this map here, uh, we're again showing you the location in relation to the airport and I-95. It's south of the I-95 and it's outside slightly from the Fayetteville MIA. Um, he's pointed out the reason behind this one about the wrecker service. This is looking down Claude Lee Road. That's the bridge over I-95. We're now over the I-95 getting closer to the property. The property's coming up now on the left. And here it is straight ahead of us. Uh, it is a wrecker service operating out of the building. And um, cars are parked in the rear, which I believe we could assume is a salvage yard or storage yard at least. Um, I've lost my information for some reason on this one, but um, need it. here's a summary of issues. <laughs> I think you've heard enough. Uh, it's, a, it's sufficient. Uh, it does comply with the standards as shown in the ordinance. Uh, again, the police department has voiced concerns over this one. Um, they looked at this one before the Lakeside one, and they immediately said that um, the type of business out there might generate an unusual large number of calls for service <clears throat> because of perhaps break-ins against the cars parked in the rear. Uh, again, the fiscal impact is hard to assess on this one. Um, in this case, the, the staff has recommended that you not approve the annexation petition. Thank you, Mr. Nash. We'll open the public hearing. Any questions for Mr. Nash on this portion? Okay, ma'am, can we open the public hearing? Uh, may we have one speaker, Mr. Larry Brickman? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Larry Brickman. I reside at 4412 Claudley Road. Been residing out there ever since I built a home under the VA loan in 1970. Used to be a wonderful place. May I, sir, Your Honor, may I? You'd give that her? to the clerk, sir. Yes, sir. She'll be happy to distribute that for you. Thank you, sir. What you're looking at and what most of you are going to see is, just like the gentleman spoke a while ago about the concerns from the police department. Right now, uh, in that area, in that general area, every night, I have, it's a dead-end road. Cloud Lee down there, there's a bar pit down there. I'm sitting between Joe Riddle and uh, Bill Wellens. The, it's getting so bad down there, Leroy, since he's opened up this place and since it's really went from a salvage yard, as you'll notice, like the city zoning committee said, it's went from a salvage yard to a junkyard. I have thieves all the time during the night. My dogs have been poisoned. My wife's vehicle has been vandalized. My vehicle has been vandalized. The city of Fable has really made this a, a wonderful place. I love this place. I was born, in, born and raised right here in the old 82nd Airborne. It was my home. And I know you people know from years ago why I used to sit here. Amen. But out there, what I'm living under is horrible. I've got, if you'll look at those pictures I still have, we have West Nile virus. I have pickup trucks across the street loaded with water, mosquitoes. Like I say, since I've been living there, we have had all kind of vandalism. I've even had to install cameras all around my house. They've snuck out to my house up under my storage building and beat my, beat my security lights out. Left a stick laying on top of the trailer. I got a bullet hole. Now, if you go down there now, you'll see a white, beautiful vinyl fence. Used to be green. <laughs> but uh, now there's a bullet hole in that. <clears throat> I went down the other day and I talked to the uh, county manager and he's praying like everything you people are going to zone this thing because he doesn't want nothing to do with it. The lady that works down here in the county manager's office says she's been here uh, 13 years, named Cindy, sweetest lady ever met in your life. Cindy says, I've been here 13 years and don't know a thing that much about the county, but I know E.B. Young, who's deceased. I remember when he was towing cars on his rollback and them locked in park and the parking brake on. I remember when the city uh, went out there to inspect and check out all those junk cars. Jesus Christ, a lot of people went to jail that day. But I'm saying this, I've got a mess. My water, my water's polluted. My, my hot water heaters aren't any good. I change them out about every three or four months. Uh, 
Bobby McArthur, 15 years county inspector. Mr. Young's cousins. Bobby McArthur had 15 years with the county. He was down there really writing them up. He got called off vacation. Bobby lived at Burn the Woods at Lazy Acres Campground. He got camp called out off vacation. He was terminated for doing his job. A few weeks later, Bobby is no longer with us. He's now deceased. If anybody, if Bobby McArthur went on your property and you weren't up to standards, you were going to get it right. Amen. I've been to the county planning uh, zoning and planning and called them and called them and complained. People coming out here dumping air conditioners. I called the county and told them and complained about my the, the air conditioner being dumped across the road, sitting on top of the rollback. This this rollback's been sitting there. You see that for 25 years. He ain't moved that ever since he's been there. But the people come out there and he put the air conditioners on there, which was given to him by Parker Gas. And the guy pulls up their side of the roll back and just shells those ACs. Bloom, bloom. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching it. Want to call Leroy because he wouldn't believe me. There's more vandalism now. There's no more quietness. Used to at night, the greatest thing in the world would be out at night and enjoy peace. Folks, I'm going to move away from there. Uh, I can go on and on and on. But when I reported to the county about these people dumping that mess over there, those air conditioners, the next thing I know, when I started reporting things and things started getting out, next thing you know, you got a guy there working at Parker's Gas, uh, Danny Blackwell, federal marshals escorted him out of there. Michael Blackwell, federal marshals locked him up going down the road, side of the road. Brandon Young, oh my Lord, Brandon, when they locked him up, he squealed like a, jaw, a jaybird. We, we probably shouldn't make this so personal, sir, so if you have something to say about the property, mm -hmm. that'd be it's appropriate. It's destroying. I've had my place evaluated. Forgive me for being personal, just the anxiety I've been going through all yes, these sir. years. Right now, it's so, situation is, it's so bad that there's no peace and rest. I've got contamination. You look at that property there, you see oil, water, like I say, the geological the geological reports, you look at them. Sandy Run runs all the way from those woods, runs all the way under Leroy, and runs to me. Years ago, my mother, mother-in-law used to wash clothes in those streams. My dad-in-law, when my mother, when my wife was born in 1948, my father-in-law was down there making liquor. Right now, those streams are so contaminated, it's horrible. Walk behind my house, exactly 100 foot behind my house, those streams are contaminated with gas and oil. Guess where those streams are going? They're going into Rockfish Creek. Anybody got any questions before I sit down? And I'm sorry for trying to, well, trying we'll, to be. We'll close the public hearing and then we'll see if we have any questions, Mr. Brigman. See if there's anyone else speaking. All right. No further speakers, ma'am. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and then uh, entertain any questions from council uh, for Mr. Brigman or staff. Hearing none, is there a motion on <clears throat> this agenda item? Mr. Bates? Uh, motion to disapprove the annexation petition second all right i have a motion and a second uh, is there any discussion on the motion may I ask for your vote please <laughs> that motion carries unanimously thank you council okay we'll move now to item 6.7 amendment to the city code and miss hilton is with us this evening thank you ma'am This is the first of four uh, text amendments that you have this evening. This one focuses on access standards and it has about three parts to it. The first one deals with cross access uh, requirements that we've placed on generally it's going to be commercial properties uh, so that adjacent properties have um, a link across their properties instead of multiple curb cuts onto the larger road. Um, the second two parts deal with access when uh, there is not direct access onto the public street. And I'll walk through those very quickly. There is a handout that I'm going to ask the clerk to share with you because there were some changes with the Planning Commission who heard the cases last week. Uh, so this is the first time that you'll actually get the recommendations. And there were some adjustments that we made. The cross access um, is actually provided for in there, and there are some opportunities for exceptions. 
those did not cover enough of the circumstances we were encountering during development. Um, you may hear of um, one speaker tonight, there was one speaker at the Planning Commission who provided an example of a situation where it just didn't make sense. It wasn't necessarily to topographic issues, but it simply didn't make economic or traffic uh, management and safety um, sense. So this actually just simply expands and clarifies the circumstances under which administratively we can say it's an unnecessary step um, and waive it at that point um, at the staff level. The next two uh, aspects of it, uh, first part is residential and then there's a question about the access for commercial. So the first part, there are a series of land, a number of landlocked parcels around the city, um, out in the county as well. Um, one of the ways in which access can be provided is through what we call a flag lot, which is where that long access road is actually owned. It's part of the property that is uh, generally behind. It's well off the public street. That has not been clarified in the ordinance, so there are no standards there for it. It isn't recognized. Uh, we are proposing a set of standards. It be at least 20 feet wide. That generally respects the uh, fire department's access. That it serve only one single family use off of that flag. That the flag be at uh, no more than 250 feet long and within 500 feet from a fire hydrant. Now, I have a drawing that will show you the kind of impact there. Within an overall subdivision, that there be no more, uh, if it's uh, less than 20 lots in that subdivision, there be no more than one flag lot. If there are more than 20, um, it's capped either by 5% or by a total of 12. And then we proposed specific standards for cul-de-sac streets. These are comparable to what was in the old code. Simply clarifies how far back you can be before it has to be um, of a certain width. But to illustrate, this is totally hypothetical. The actual circumstances of these parcels is a little different. But you can see in the one section what we would call the long flag. Um, this is the pole. And then in this instance, it is access to this property, so this is the flag. Um, the assumptions under the new standards would be this is a minimum of 20 feet wide. This length of the pole is no more than 250 feet. Uh, and the relationship to the fire hydrant is, let's say that's 250 feet, then the fire hydrant couldn't be more than 250 feet either way on the road. So a total of 500 feet between wherever that hydrant is located and up the flag to the property. Um, in this instance, only one of these lots could be accessed off of that flag. And it, again, the distinction here is that it is owned. It is a part of the property. So we're not dealing with easements, which are much more difficult to manage. There's a similar issue with um, a standard in these um, subdivision standards about non-residential property. It must be on a private or public street. There are numerous instances, used to be called group development in our code, where um, individual parcels are not actually fronting on a public or private street, but they are developable parcels. Uh, in this instance, there would be provision for a recorded easement or right-of-way. The access road has to meet the city standards, and there is a maintenance agreement that's incorporated with it. We are going to begin mentioning, um, and it wasn't in your report, so I'm calling it out in our presentation here, that it is generally supported by uh, both adopted policy plans that you have, your strategic plans, and by the 2030 vision plan. Um, we do see it as supported by specific policies in those two documents. And the Planning Commission and the staff do recommend approval. Uh, there are the two modifications that I mentioned to you that clarify the language about overall length of the pole and access and relationship to the hydrants. Um, we do recommend approval. <coughs> any questions? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Applewhite. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Now, quite honestly, prior to a case that we had about two weeks ago about a property on Rayf Rayford Road, I didn't know what a flag pole lot thing was. So, but handling that case, 
I started thinking about the areas in Western Fayetteville that have been annexed into the city. They've been existing in a certain way for many, many years. And particularly that, um, that lot, their um, road, their flagpole was only, I think, about 15 feet wide versus the 20 that you're recommending. And so if we use that as an example, say if something happened to those structures there and they wanted to rebuild, and that lot and that road is only that flagpole is only 15 feet, how does this impact them? W would, would they not be able to build again because that flagpole is only 15 feet? If we put this in the ordinance, or is there a way to grandfather um, properties that are already existing in this state that don't meet this 20-foot requirement? Our preference is not to grandfather in these instances, um, particularly if it's an easement situation or something like that. If it's an existing situation, there may be circumstances in which they have the ability to redevelop, um, to reuse it within a period of time. Um, I think the subdivision waiver would be the other option um, for the five feet that's missing. And then it would be a judgment as to whether that's a problem for uh, fire and safety uh, access, emergency access. So, like, using that one property as an example, it was just like, I think it was two, well, a daycare, a second home, and then a third home in the back. Would, would that constitute a subdivision waiver? That's a specific instance. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> he knows the details. Uh, uh, Miss Hilton um, doesn't know the details of that one. You okay, granted sorry. a subdivision waiver. And that uh, is a, an approval in the same manner as a variance is an approval for a, a change to a setback or other dimensional standard. Mm -hmm. And that runs with the land. So it, it, uh, you've approved that one. That one will, uh, will remain if, if the uh, lot that is created that uh, uh, accesses that easement, uh, something unfortunate happens to the <coughs> It could be rebuilt. So I use that as an example, but just say there's an, another one, a separate one out there, because I got a feeling that in Western Fayetteville, that those county standards, there's probably a bunch of them hanging around out there. <clears throat> so this would affect them in what way? If, if there's other ones that have a 15-foot flagpole, how does this affect them? What's the impact to them? Um, I, I think they will fall under our nonconforming standards. Uh, with regard to uh, to existing situations, um, what we looked at before was it was a vacant lot, uh, and that's why a waiver had to be granted to access it. Okay. Additionally, the planning commission, uh, I understand, uh, last week asked staff to start to look at these situations and bring forward uh, ideas for them to consider and uh, to start discussing uh, with uh, with them. <laughs> to address uh, issues that we see uh, like this uh, elsewhere in this, this city. Okay. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that we will uh, at least uh, be able to bring you some uh, longer-term solutions to this uh, apparent, uh, apparently uh, significant problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Karen. Mr. Fowler. Yes, Ms. Hilton. Uh, the purpose behind this determination of 20 feet is to do what? Uh, 20 feet is typically the minimum width for the fire department um, for access, clearance, uh, setting up to either side if they need to stop there and, and begin to unload equipment. And, and uh. So is there any requirement in the policy for that 20-foot that piece of land that comes from the flag, the, for lack of a better term, the pole coming to the street? Is there any requirement in that 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 uh, piece of land be cleared? Um, in the development process, it would be a cleared. Uh, it would be a paved, improved drive. Is that is that in is that spelled out in the policy? And does it spell out that it'll be a paved, improved drive that's 20 feet wide? In other words, going the full width of the of the flagpole. Typically, you don't pave the full width. Um, you need that clearance to move. Not clearance. You need that that room to set up on either side, um, if need be. In this case, the access to the property is really what is necessary in that clearing process um, for the ten minimum 10 to 12 feet. The development standards, the property as it um, goes to, for its building permit, 
they would double check the drive and it is now required uh, for all residential property to be an improved surface. And for those that were that were brought in who don't have that width? It would be probably a subdivision waiver. If it's an existing lot, it would be an existing non-conforming, existing development it would be an existing non-conforming situation. If it's a new development, they would go through a process much like um, was just described with the waiver. So they would have the waiver. opportunity to have the waiver. They would come to us and we would still be able to grant a waiver. Is that what Subdivision you're waivers generally go to the planning commission. Uh, it is quasi-judicial, but they would go there. Mm -hmm. If it goes, once it goes to the Planning Commission, though, would it then come to us or would it stop at the Planning Commission? Um, apparently the, it came here the last time, yeah. So it would still come here? It, I think it was the first one that we've had under this. We haven't typically in the past had anybody appeal these, these situations. They simply are undevelopable lots. Okay. So there are no I, options. I'm loath to prevent people from being able to use their lots. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we'll open the public hearing, ma'am. Um, Mr. Mayor, we have one speaker, Mr. Morrison West. Good evening. How do you do it, Good evening. Does this work here, this machine? I don't know about it. Does we can help you with that. Okay, sir. Something I got. Yes, sir. It does. Let's see if I can get it going. Stop the time now. <laughs> I hadn't started yet, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Marson West. I own West Automotive on Riley Road. It got wiped out with a tornado back on April 16th. And as we go along here, because I've been a tornado victim, we're allowed certain things and, and we learn things after the fact. And this is one that she's talking about access to, to property. I've been there for 37 years, 50 to 70 hours a, a week I worked there. Uh, I fought the tornado. I fought the insurance company, fighting the thieves, and now I'm dealing with the city. Now, I think there's quite a, quite a bit there going on, but the main thing about here is the gentleman next door to me rebuilt. Well, he come to me three months ago and asked for, could he drive across my lot? I said, no, no way, liability issues. You know, I don't need that. Well, I thought he rebuilt and moved, made his building smaller, and I felt here that somebody missed the size of his building and made me the scapegoat. Because what's happened is his building is, I guess, yeah, is right here. We was told if you have a side street, you come in from the side. No longer the DOT is blocked Riley Road. I've got two exits, he's got one. Well, fine, that's good, I'm, I'm, I'll go along with that. Both our streets are identical, stop signs at the end, no stop lights or anything else. He comes in right here, and that's his, his entrance, and then he stops right here. I let him build his line 25 years ago, the land he bought the property from. My property's here, two driveways, <coughs> here. Well, I'm fine with that. Then the other day I moved the dumpster, and he said, I'm sure glad you moved that, so I can drive across your lot now. I said, we can drive across my lot. He said, well, the city said it's okay. I said, no, that can't be right. Well, I talked to the city, and it's just, you know, they say there's a rule that you can do this. Well, if there's a third lot in the middle and the man could not get to Riley Road, yes, you might come across my lot or his lot. I have my own lot. I bought a big enough lot. Mine's 198 by 200. His is 98 by 200. His building should have been controlled for him to turn around his own parking lot and come back out the same way he come in. I just think it's wrong that you say, well, you can go across this man's lot over here. So I'm losing eight feet over here for sidewalk and curbing, 10 feet ex, ex, uh, wait, call it assessment, or for our company, uh, three feet on the left. Now we're talking about coming across my parking lot, and liability is a big issue with me. And I know the first person to get sued if his people come across my lot and something happens, I'm going to be the first one because I own the property. And I think it's just wrong that you can do that because we both have two separate lots. There's no third lot in the middle. You know, here they approved something that, hey, he should have went out of the same driveway he come in at. Would have been his building would have been moved back to the front because I think you got to have so much between the building and his curb. And, I mean, he knew three months before because he asked me the question. And I just think in this case that there's no way anybody should be coming across my lot. I own that lot. I paid for that lot. I worked for that lot. Uh, I just can't understand how anybody said, we are going across. I know we got to, you know, blocking off the driveway DOT, that's great. It would be great if they opened his DOT back here where he was at. But, of course, you know, DOT is a different person. But that would be a, a cure to this problem. 
So that's the biggest thing I got. I mean, you know, I want to see a modification. I don't think anything's going to help me, though, at this. It's just going to say we can modify something. I don't think anybody's going to say, look, we're not going to allow that to happen to you. But we took my .9 commercial lot and made it smaller and smaller and smaller from all sides. And when you get ready to sell it or do what you do with it, you know, commercial property is very, very valuable. And that's what I'm here for, just to ask y'all to consider this. And I don't know who you talk to about anything after this, but uh, like I say, our lots have been cut down there. And I, Thank you for coming. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, stand by. We could have some questions, sir. Pardon me? Just, uh, we'll close the public here, and we could have some questions, oh, okay. so just okay. stand by. No further speakers, sir. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, close the public hearing, and I'm sure staff, someone can help us uh, put all this together here. Uh, Mayor and council members, uh, the amendment before you tonight doesn't have anything to do with the issue that this gentleman is referring to, but we'll be happy to uh, look into it and, and give you a report back and coordinate with him uh, as well uh, with regard to it. All right, sir. Sound like a plan? Is everybody happy with that? Mr. Chair, Mr. Schufer, Mr. Chair has a question, sir. Mr. Schufert, had you heard of this concern before tonight? Uh, as far as a cross access uh, requirement, uh, I have not heard of this particular one. I do know that uh, as properties are developed, we do um, look to um, uh, uh, establish those cross access things, but I, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure we can do it without the consent of the property owner, which is why I need to, a little time to report back to y'all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Actually, the amendment that we've got uh, before you this evening right now would make it easier for us to address the situation he's just described, which is where you have just two properties and you have the opportunity to go to a side street. Side streets are essentially the same, no difference, so they don't need that cross access. It doesn't benefit on the, you know, limiting I think curb the cuts. important thing tonight, the motion we're doing tonight does not make his situation that he described, nor does it make it worse. Are you telling us that? Gives us an option to address it. Okay. And we look forward to your report, Mr. Shuford. Yes, Any additional questions on item 6.7, Council? How about a motion? Mr. Hurst? Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. I uh, move to adopt the amended amendment as a, po as a pro uh, proposed. Excuse me. Thank you, sir. There's a Thank you, Ms. Davies. Is there any discussion on that motion? Let me ask you a vote, please. Okay, that motion carries. Those in favor, Mr. Chris, Mr. Bates, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Art, Ms. Davies, Mr. Hare, Mr. Massey, in opposition, Ms. Applewhite, and Mr. Fowler. Okay, we'll move now to item 6.8, uh, CD Code Chapter 30. Ms. Hilton? Or Ms. Shuford? Oh, these have gotten small, so I can tell which one is which. Sorry, I'm taking so long finding the um, the PowerPoint. Yeah. I may have to bring them up just yeah, to be just, able to just, see. just tell us about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just tell us right, about man. it. <laughs> we get ready to so move you. <laughs> all right, well, I, I hear you. Get ready to get them so moved <laughs> next week. Right. I'm, right. I'm actually not, uh, <laughs> well, there's one of them, but that's, here we go. I'm sorry it took so long to discover that one. We're going to put you on another agenda. <laughs> and after all that ado, I really only have one slide for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, our um, 
Our downtown zoning district, um, uh, we're proposing a number of different amendments to it, and those amendments are, are um, intended to, to um, address what I think was a, an effort to bring, um, uh, uh, to some extent, suburban standards into our downtown. And um, we've had a, a fair amount of discussion with you, the uh, planning commission, with the downtown stakeholders as well. And uh, here's what we've come up with. Uh, the first one would eliminate minimum parking and loading requirements in the downtown. It's very difficult to provide that parking, and uh, anyone who does residential is likely to, uh, to look for ways to provide it, but this keeps you from having to provide it. Um, the second one is to eliminate density requirements. We currently have a density cap in the downtown of 40 units an acre. Um, uh, that is a very low number for urban environments. It sounds high, but it is quite low. And uh, 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 we would uh, uh, propose eliminate, eliminating that and let the, the bulk standards of the ordinance, the height and the uh, uh, setback requirements, determine how many residential units you might can get in. Uh, the th third change would be to modify our, what we call our glazing requirements basically the area of the uh, uh, facade that faces the street that has glass in it or a doorway and the intent behind that is to to make it easier uh, because we're reducing the requirement uh, from 60 percent to 50 percent which is a, a much more doable uh, provision uh, certain landscaping requirements in the downtown uh, the uh, the ordinance does uh, provide uh, for tree planting and uh, foundation landscaping on downtown buildings, um, downtown properties. Um, we need to, that's basically an oversight, and we need to clear that one up. Uh, but if someone did a surface parking lot, we would still retain the, uh, the parking lot landscaping standards that are elsewhere in the code. Um, modifying the setback requirements, that is one of the biggest ones here. Uh, in downtowns, typically you do want your buildings to be built up close to the, uh, the, the sidewalk and the, at the, the edge of the property. But in some cases, certain types of uses, uh, if you think about them, uh, typically places of worship and civic uses like uh, courthouses, uh, city halls, museums, uh, that sort of uh, situation, you, you have areas that... Uh, uh, you want to actually separate the, the buildings from the, uh, uh, the, the immediate edge of the, uh, the sidewalk and street. Just like we have a courtyard out in front of City Hall, which helps when people come out and uh, congregate. Likewise, with, uh, with churches, uh, whenever there are weddings, funerals, or other gatherings, uh, you don't want the, the congregation pouring immediately right out into the sidewalk. And in fact, uh, Virtually every church in, in our downtown would be non-conforming under our current requirements. So we're suggesting that we, we modify this to avoid that problem. The last two deal with uh, open space and parkland requirements. Uh, very difficult to, to provide either one of those in, uh, in, in a downtown, highly urban setting where you're expecting buildings to be built uh, property line to property line. Um, we largely exempt uh, the open space requirements uh, under this ordinance, and uh, we would eliminate entirely the parkland requirements. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, uh, we have uh, run this uh, by um, our downtown stakeholders, and I, I believe we don't have anyone here to speak on this <laughs> issue, uh, which indicates we've done a fairly good job of, of communicating with them. Any questions for Mr. Schufer? Okay, ma'am, let's open the public hearing, please. Mr. Mayor, we have no speakers for this item. Okay, we'll close the public <coughs> hearing and entertain any additional questions or a motion from council. Ms. Davey? I'd like to make a motion um, that we approve the proposed changes of, um, proposed by staff. Okay, have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Any discussion on the motion? Matthew, your vote, please. That is unanimous. Thank you. We'll move now to item 6.9. K-12 
Okay, Mayor and Council members, this is a code amendment. We spent a fair amount of time talking about at um, our agenda review meeting. And it um, is basically modifying separation distances for group homes, halfway houses, and transitional housing, and as well as establishing a new transitional housing use. Um, the proposal is really um, in three parts. The first one is that the ordinance does nothing to um, change the, uh, the half mile separation distance for group homes, uh, halfway houses, and other uh, facilities of this type in residential zoning districts. The second one is that uh, uh, group homes uh, and, and halfway houses and transitional housing, uh, should you approve that new use, uh, would be approved through a special use permit process and in non-residential districts, that separation distance would be determined by you uh, taking into account the individual circumstances of the, the property uh, to, um, uh, to uh, determine the separation requirement. And then the last one, probably the simplest one, is to establish transitional housing as a new group living use. Um, let me take that first <coughs> one. Uh, I won't beat this one to death, but I, I do want it very clearly understood that we are not suggesting any modification to the half mile separation distance in residential zoning areas. Uh, so there's no change to the current separation requirements in the residential zoning uh, districts in this ordinance. Uh, the second one, um, again, we've got the 26. 140 foot, which is a half mile separation distance uh, between these types of facilities. There's no way to vary it. Um, and, and as a bit of history, the, the separation standards were established uh, uh, several years ago to uh, around 2001 to address a, a real problem that the city was having because the state uh, had changed its policies with regard to uh, uh, handling uh, 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 people with various types of disabilities and they were being mainstreamed and brought to um, to homes uh, and uh, and there was a huge uh, uh, monetary reason for people to want to open up residential property to uh, these uh, these uh, new residents uh, now that has changed because the state policy has again changed and the funding is not there so the pressure's off somewhat but what we're proposing is in non-residential districts to allow the special use permit process to, to make that determination. And here might be some reasons that you might want to reduce the separation requirements. Perhaps there's a, a topographical feature, such as a river that would be between um, uh, two types of uses of, of a similar type or maybe a major transportation facility. Maybe they're on one side of all American and on the, one on the other. Uh, maybe they're, they're very, very far distant, but not quite a half mile from uh, other uh, group living facilities. And then, of course, you, you can also take into account uh, the testimony that's given during the special use permit process to decide <coughs> other reasons. Now, we have a 500-foot separation requirement between a, a bar and nightclub and a church, for example, and, and that's shown there on the right side. Our group home separation is, is this larger circle, which gives you some perspective about the scale uh, of the, uh, the impact of uh, the current separation requirements. Uh, finally, the, the last one is the new transitional housing use. Um, most of our group living definitions limit the population uh, of the people who are being housed to people having either mental or physical disabilities or in the case of halfway houses, people being released from incarceration. Um, but we've seen uh, with the recession that, that many people are homeless for, uh, for reasons that are just financial, not a disability or some sort of incarceration issue. Um, families change and, and there are issues created. So we feel like we need a transitional housing uh, use to uh, accommodate uh, uh, those folks. It would be allowed in the same uh, districts as the large group homes, uh, still be required as a special use permit, and uh, so you would get a chance to see them. Um, 
that is my presentation on this. Uh, I understand last week the Planning Commission heard this and, and did recommend uh, uh, that you adopt it and staff does as well. All right, sir. Any uh, questions for Mr. Shuford? <coughs> Mr. Bates? Um, this is no question. Make a motion. No, we have to have a public hearing, sir. Oh, uh, that's right. Okay. Just told you. The yep. Okay, we'll open the public hearing, ma'am. Uh, sir, our first speaker is Mr. Charles Morris. <clears throat> Thank you, Council. My name is Charles Morris, 831 Arsenal Avenue. Um, We've been um, working on this for some time with the planning staff, um, and uh, and they've been very very helpful. Uh, actually, my previous employment history, um, I used to work for HSA Cumberland Hospital uh, while I was in college uh, in the in the uh, mid 80s and then early 90s. I was still doing a little bit, and during that time, uh, the William Group Home uh, court case had come up. And basically, mental health and some Medicaid funding and some other fundings came about. And uh, these group homes were um, designed to house, you know, six to one, up to six uh, individuals. And basically, it became an a overnight industry. And then that industry um, popped up all over the, the county. And it not only included the the residents within Cumberland County, it also included residents outside of it. And the group home situation um, got to the point where sometimes there were two or three of them side by side, uh, and it became uh, an issue before you all. And actually, uh, when I went back through the minutes where you all addressed it before, Mr. Massey was, was the only one, I, I think I'm looking through the names here, but actually Mr. Massey was the only one that was here at that time when you all were addressing it. And when I went through all the notes and looked at them, basically the city council um, was, was, was looking at a 800 foot to a quarter mile separation. And all through the minutes and the notes, it all referred to is the uh, integrity of the residential neighborhoods and maintaining that uh, uh, residential character. And basically this was allowing businesses to, to infiltrate those residential areas. Um, the reason I'm supporting this text amendment is because I think the integrity of the neighborhoods is extremely important, and this text amendment does not in any way, shape, or form address what has already been passed here and is in place tonight. Um, but what it does address is it addressed um, some of this transitional housing, um, and especially in these uh, commercial districts, and, and the commercial districts provide their own separations, um, you know, due to their parking and their retention and their, and their um, buffering. But basically, through the special use process, the staff has 100% control over that. And, uh, and, and, and that should be up to the special use uh, process. That's why you have the process. The process works well. And, um, and, and we're supporting the text amendment because it makes things work very well. Because there is a lack of funding with mental health, with Medicare, with um, Medicaid, all the different uh, uh, budget cuts that have come about, the majority of these group homes have either shut down um, or are very restricted in their funding and, and their life is, is, is somewhat limited. My Thank time you, is Mr. up. Morris. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. Sir, our next speaker is Mr. John Tyson. Mr. Mayor, good evening. Members of the council, I, my name is John Tyson. My address is 101 Hay Street, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm also here to speak in favor of the text amendment. Mr. Morris and I had met with staff on several occasions after it became apparent that there was a half a mile separation Regardless of zoning district, it was an absolute half mile that you could not put group homes, therapeutic homes, and halfway houses. I don't want to repeat what Mr. Schufer and Mr. Morris said. I want to concentrate on one thing, and that is the inclusion of halfway houses with, trans, with, with therapeutic and group homes did not arise until the UDO. The ordinance prior to the UDO applied only to group homes within residential neighborhoods. 
we think in, in discussions with staff that was a drafting era that brought the halfway house use and put it in the same category as a group home. They're completely different. The needs are different. My understanding of this amendment is simply this. As to the, the risk of, of subdivision, residential subdivision, nothing changes. You still have the half mile. What Mr. Shuford said, and the reason I'm supporting it is, if you have a river, a major highway, or a major barrier, and you're outside of a residential area, this council, along with the Zoning Commission, would have the discretion to review that particular use, and if it's less than a half mile from a, from a group home, therapeutic home, you would still have the ability to approve <coughs> that specific use only outside of the residential district. The original intent was to protect neighborhoods, protect residential neighborhoods. This text amendment preserves that protection. I ask that the council favorably consider and vote to approve the text amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. So we have no further speakers. Okay, uh, we'll uh, close the public hearing and uh, Mr. Shuford, one question just came up uh, maybe you could help me with, sir, that Mr. Tyson just mentioned. This before the UDO and after the UDO, in, in the commercial zoning before the UDO was adopted, were there limitations on uh, how close these type of facilities could be in a commercial zone before the UDO? Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm not uh, uh, certain on that, but uh, I could find out in a fairly short order. All right. Do you know, Ms. Hilton? I think we actually have uh, the minutes that, uh, and the, uh, the actual motion that was made to increase the distances. It may well have been that, um, uh, that we have been operating, uh, this I can't answer tonight, it may well have been that we were operating uh, with a, an interpretation that they also applied to halfway houses. In much the same way, if you recall, uh, when we had our separation standards between uh, uh, bars and nightclubs and, and child care centers, for example, we, we replied that as a, uh, uh, as a reciprocal arrangement so that you would not have a, uh, a child care center locating next to uh, or nearby a, a nightclub um, because your ordinance there just simply said that a bar or nightclub could not be closer than 500 feet to uh, uh, a um, uh, a child care center, but I can't answer the uh, the interpretation part of it tonight, but I think I can bring forward the actual uh, uh, code uh, uh, amendment that occurred um, in uh, if you can give me about uh, four or well, five perhaps minutes Mr. To Tyson that. can you can you shed any light on that sir? I think you were the one that made the <coughs> quote. Mr. Mayor, when we reviewed the the, the minutes from two thousand and one mm -hmm. All of the references in there were solely to group homes, solely in residential districts. There was no mention in there of therapeutic homes nor, half, nor halfway houses. All of the discussion from the minutes was solely related to group homes in residential subdivisions. Right. But this, this uh, mention that you made, that, that change with the UDO, <clears throat> can you shed any light on that? That's the part we seem to be a little bit unclear on, if that's a true statement or not. Mr. Mr. Mayor, in discussions with the staff, <coughs> I was led to believe that the addition of halfway houses within the restriction of group homes only occurred in the UDO, and that was not true prior to the UDO. Right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hare. I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm still uh, following Mr. Schufer. So now, <coughs> when this item, when this item came forward, and, and I brought this item forward in, in, in those years, it was, are you saying then it's only reflecting the residential from understanding, it's only reflecting just group homes and not these other groups uh, within the residential area. You're not saying that that half a mile went into the commercial uh, community with these other homes, like the transitional home, the halfway house. Is that what we're 
Well, you, you, let me you, let me get back to the, this slide. I think it'll uh, it'll help us. Um, the uh, half mile separation doesn't distinguish between residential and non residential right now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a half mile, and it uh, governs the location of group homes, therapeutic homes, which are typically smaller in scale, and halfway houses. Uh, halfway house is a facility that deals with folks who are being released from an incarceration situation. Group homes uh, deal with folks with uh, some form of disability, as do therapeutic homes, but therapeutic homes are small. So we've got those, um, uh, those separation standards that apply whether the uh, group living use is located in a residential area or a commercial area. What we're saying tonight, or at least what this ordinance would do, is to maintain the separation requirements in residential zoning districts. But in a commercial district, it would allow you as city council to consider a special use permit that would allow one of these types of uses and decide on the merits of the case whether or not uh, you felt it was appropriate to allow that as a, um, uh, uh, a special use permit in a, in a commercial or non-residential zoning district. So if I'm, if I'm just understanding probably more for my clarification than anyone, uh, are, am I hearing you saying that when this, when, when, when we developed this in 2001, if, if that's what it is, it only was, you're saying it, it, it only was for group homes. Um, I believe that's what Judge Tyson's saying. Okay, so then from that point until today, there was never, ever any other type of um, case to come before us concerning this type of a matter, the reason that we are where we are now. It, it never happened from 2001 to, two, to 2012. That's correct. There's not been a, um, a substantive change to the text um, uh, between the, the length of time uh, from 2001 when, when the separation standard went from 800 feet to um, a half mile um, to, uh, to today, uh, other than the possibility that uh, Judge Tyson has raised that halfway houses are, have been added to the uses that need to have the separation standard. Yeah. And well, I have to confirm that. I'm sorry I don't have that yeah, information. Because I, it's just kind of hard for me to... to to, to accept that from that point to this point, that type of interest was never ever brought up for a, a rezoning case. I mean, never ever. And, right. And um, unless everything was grouped into that one, and that's how it went up to now, and because we are where we are tonight, or whenever this issue started coming up, then you started looking at a separation. Well, what we've been doing is have been applying the separation standards um, since the the time that uh, the uh, it was put in place in 2001, and it, at that time there were a, a whole lot of facilities, right. largely small group homes, right. uh, which uh, had sprung up in neighborhoods that uh, didn't meet the standards, and over time some of them have. Uh, uh, transition to other uses and are no longer active and they cannot be reestablished. So I, I think the, the real issue is that we've not had, at least from what my staff tells me, we've not had a lot of larger um, uh, group home, halfway house type applications. The, the predominant ones that were uh, an issue were the small ones uh, that uh, peppered the city and then uh, we uh, uh, have not had a lot of large ones come forward, uh, but even if they came forward, they still would have to get a special use permit from you, uh, whether they're in a residential zoning district <coughs> or a commercial district. And then secondly, um, uh, if they couldn't meet the separation distance, we turned them away. We said that property is not one that we can even bring forward, if that helps. And, and that's, I'm sure that's why you haven't seen any of them. Mr. Fowler. So, shoot. Um, just for purposes of clarification, 
if we had um, a group home or a halfway house in a commercial or non-residential area, and that was less than a half a mile from a residential area uh, that was allowed, then someone wanted to put one in a residential area that would be less than a half a mile from one of the commercial, that one would automatically be not brought forward because it has to meet the separation requirements because it's in a residential area, that's correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And if there, but if there is one that's currently in a residential area, there could possibly be a special use permit to allow one in a non-residential area less than a half a mile. But once again, it had to be that's done by correct. special use permit. Is that that's correct? That's exactly right. And many of these people that go to this, and this is something you may not be able to answer, but many of these people that would be going into these facilities are going in there because they have nowhere else to go. Is that correct? Uh, it would be assumed? Uh, we, we would <clears throat> assume that they're, they're locating in these facilities because that's the best place for them. Okay. So, and if they didn't have that facility to go to, there's no separation requirement for them from when they sleep under a bridge or wherever else near where you are without supervision. That's a rhetorical question, sir. Okay. Two different Let me follow up on that because I'm, I'm a little confused by this. And so let's say that um, you have a residential, a commercial area that abuts a residential area. I guess all of them do, but let's just say that that happened. And uh, someone wants to put a halfway home in the commercial area. How is the residential people impacted by that? Are they able to speak to that? Are there any parameters, or is it is that? Yes, sir. They they would. Um, if there's, let me ask. If there's one within a half mile of that commercial area in a residential area, let's say right behind it, let's just say there's a halfway house in the residential area behind it, and then there were going to be a request for one in the commercial area which abuts that. How would that process work? Well, it would be a special use permit process mm -hmm. uh, under this uh, proposed code change. It would come to you as a special use permit. We would note the proximity of the. Uh, a facility that's in the residential zoning district as part of our staff report and show it on a map uh, and you would have an idea of how close together they were uh, whether they were separated by any barriers um, uh, whether it be a topographical barrier a transportation barrier a rail line or something along those lines and um, you would have the ability then to also hear from the uh, uh, the people who received notices because we, we would notice a special use permit just as we've done for zoning cases and, and uh, uh, other items that come before But those, those people today are protected in that residential area. They're protected by knowing that it w there would, could not be one closer than a half mile from them, and that they're losing some of that protection. I mean, the that, process is in yes, place, sir. I guess, for a council to make a decision. But that, That's correct. Yes, sir. Other questions? Uh, we get everybody, Mr. Howard, Mr. Chairman. Anybody else having questions? I'd like to follow up on your point there okay. just real quickly. Uh, currently, if there is no halfway house, group home, or whatever in a residential area that butts up next to a commercial area, and someone wanted to put one of those in the commercial area, now there's no separation requirement issues because there's not one within a half mile in that residential area. It doesn't have to be half a mile. No, I'm talking about there's not a unit, there's not a current one within a half a mile, but the, the commercial property abuts to the residential area. If there's not a separation issue in the instance of the half mile, then you could you could still put one there, right? You, you could put one in, in certain of the residential zoning districts with a special use permit. Yeah, you could either put it in the residential area or in the non-commercial. I mean the non-residential. Yes, yes, sir. If the, if the separation requirement is met, right? That's correct. So, in other words, you could not only could you have one abutted to a residential area, you could actually have it in the residential area if there's not a half mile separation issue. That's right. It, it, again, it would be up to the council's discretion. Okay. And under, under what you're talking about now, it would come under a special use permit, in which case then the citizens would be protected because you'd have the special use permit re request that has to be filled. Well, just to continue this dialogue that we're having, if yeah. you have an existing one in a residential area, which is already there, yeah, and then someone wanted to put one in the commercial area that was less than a half mile away from you, you would have the opportunity for that to be put there right. under That's this true. change. You would not have that. You do not have that opportunity today. That's what I was talking about. That you're at least giving up that opportunity. Not that a council could it'd be a special use permit, but at least let's acknowledge it for what it is. Yeah. You would the residential person does have the risk of something else being put there. 
That was my point. That's that's exactly correct. Uh, the the ordinance would allow uh, you to to put them quite, <coughs> potentially quite close together if you found justification for it. Uh, but by the same token, uh, I think Mr. Fowler's point was that if you located one uh, in an area that uh, did not have a separation uh, requirement, or or you went through this this other process, then that residential area uh, would, for a half mile around it, would not be able to have a, a group home or halfway house uh, being considered for it. Yeah. No, no, sir. Mr. Chris. Yeah, I, I'm trying to sort this thing out. And every time I hear something, it kind of stirs me again. All right, we have a 2,640-foot distance from a group home into a residential area, right? Uh, yes, sir. It's, it's actually to in, in residential and non-residential. See, see the word in the residential district is what kind of bothered me a little bit. But now you say to us, if we approve this, someone could apply for a special use permit to put a group home in a non-residential district, we put it next to food line or wherever, <clears throat> But across the street is a residential district. Yes. We couldn't put it there, or we could approve the special use permit and violate our own buffer, or what? What are we doing? Here? Well, well, the, the way it would work, Mr. Crisp, and, and I want to make sure that you all understand this completely, is that um, you, in a residential zoning district, that half-mile distance is, is sacred. So let, let's say someone put uh, one of these... Um, uh, facilities in a commercial area that was near or abutting a residential district, it would create a new half mile semicircle uh, around that neighborhood in which no other um, uh, group home use could go in, in the residential part of it. But in a non residential area, uh, you would be able to establish the use even if there was, uh, in the mayor's example, uh, a close by. Uh, group home that was in the residential area too. Did, does that make Just sense? Curious, why would why would you have taken that part away? Why why couldn't it come that it allowed this whole process, but you also took into consideration the 500 feet if there was one in a residential area that abutted the commercial project? Why would that not have continued? Well, I I, I think that uh, I mean you, you could establish some other standard that would say that. Um, in no case uh, can they be closer than 500 feet or 1,000 feet or whatever the, the number that you would want. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'd like to think that you would take, in fact, the ordinance specifically says the proximity of other uh, of these type of group living facilities is something that you need to take into account as you evaluate the special use permit. So if, if there was one nearby and you felt that there was too much of a congregation, that would be an opportunity for you to say uh, uh, no to the special use permit request. Mr. Uh, Mayor, one other? I think Mr. Bates will okay. sir, and then Mr. Fowler. Uh, Mr. Juford, okay, so if there's a group home inside a residential area and another group home wants to come in, that is 2,650 feet away, there, you would say yes for them to go forward with a special use permit That's to go correct. in. Okay, now if they went in at 2,540 feet, currently you would say no, drop it, that zit. No further discussion. Well, if, if you'll change it to 39 feet, I'll say absolutely. Okay, th 2,639 <laughs> feet. You know, I mean, anything within that, within a residential, right now you would say no, and the discussion doesn't go any further. That's correct. All this this here will do is that, that does not change at all. That stays the same. Yes, sir. In a non-residential area, if there's a group home that is – 2,639 feet away from the where I want to put one in, you would say only if council approves a special use permit. That's correct. Okay. Now, if it's 2,641 feet, then it's still if council approves a special use permit. That's exactly right. Okay. Well, if I understand it, I think we can. I mean, 
Mr. Fowler? I'm usually the, the last one to understand something. The only other thing here, and I want to bring out as far as appointing, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Mr. Shuford, one of the ways that this can protect neighborhoods is that currently if you have a place where someone would want, want to put a facility in a, in a non-residential area, but the separation's not there, but there is a residential area that abuts, and it would be, uh, then it would fall beyond the distance. In other words, like if you look at Mr. Bates' thing of being 2,640 versus 2,680 or whatever, they could go into the adjacent neighborhood now and have that separation and actually put it in the neighborhood rather than put it in, rather than have the flexibility to put it in the, in the non-residential area because we were able to be a little more flexible with the separation in non-residential areas. And I think that gives us more protection of neighborhoods rather than less if we do that. Okay, other questions? Okay, ready for a motion, I think. Mr. Bates? Um, yes, sir, motion to approve the ordinance changes, amendment changes, as presented. As presented, okay. Second. Bates, seconded by Mr. Fowler. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, let me ask for your vote, please. Which one you want? Red. Okay. None this. I've got two counts here, so one, two, three, four. Five. Um, he, his is red. He just red. told me. So that motion uh, fails. Uh, all in favor of the motion, Mr. Chris, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, uh, Mr. Mr. Got two Fowler. Lights on. His is red. I it with my foot. I his is red. So that's five to five. Motion does not carry. Mr. Arp clarified that before I showed the lights. I'd seen both of those. Is there another motion on the floor? Mr. Bates? Uh, motion to defer and have it brought back to our council work session for further discussion and clarification. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second, second that motion. Uh, Mr. Hurst, I think, was the first. Any questions on that motion, council? Let me ask you a vote, please. Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, we'll go now to item, I believe it's 6.10. Okay, this is um, very, just very quickly, primarily adjustments and corrections. Adjustments are very limited. Um, I would call the first one in this list um, an adjustment, really. Uh, it's the parking location table. One of those footnotes, the very first one, describes the parking as being limited between the front edges of the building, essentially. So if it's placed in front of the building, it has to be between um, the ends of the building. And that has created a really awkward situation because in most cases you have a drive aisle coming up beside that building and you normally would put parking on both sides of that drive aisle as you come up. And the current uh, footnote absolutely prohibits that. So this simply deletes that footnote. Um, the second part is doesn't change the language, but what it does is take two pieces that have to do with that appeal of, uh, yeah, the appeal process for when there is a proposed connection between a, an existing stub street and a new street. One of those portions talks about um, the percent of people who have to agree to the um, sign on for the appeal, and that's over in section 2.C5. The other half of the process is over in section 2.C18. This simply brings them together and puts them under the appeal process and explains the specific provisions for how someone would go about taking exception to that proposed connection. The third one is a standard that actually was in the old ordinance. What it does is recognize that when you have a corner property, there are essentially two front yards. So you have a setback typically of 25 to 30 feet on the, the normal front, and then on that corner side, you have the same setback. And the older ordinance, it recognized that began to squeeze your development site, your, your home site, your building site, quite a bit. So it allowed you to, sh to shrink your rear yard and gave you a little bit more usable property on that 
typical lot size because you gave up so much for the side yard and so much for the front yard. So it allows it to drop back typically from about 30 feet to 25 feet. Um, the next one, simply a correction, it's in Article 5, which is your development standards. Article 6 is subdivisions. The term subdivision has no meaning at all in Article 5, um, it, no purpose in being in that table. The last one doesn't, again, change the standards. What it tries to do is make clear a very um, difficult to read figure. There are a couple of references that make it sound as though the lot area is also having to be met. Uh, briefly, zero lot line allows a lot of flexibility. It's a standard in the old ordinance and it's a standard in the um, new regulations. We are trying to make it clear that you have flexibility in the lot area within that subdivision. But on those edges where it's across from, a, say, a, a traditional neighborhood, that front and side setback has to be met because you're essentially looking at something and you want it to be relatively comparable, um, one side of the street to the other or immediately beside each other. Uh, the overall size of the lot isn't what is so critical. And the last one um, is things such as overhang instead of overhand. It is truly your typographical errors. So if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Any questions for Ms. Hilton? Thank you, ma'am. We'll open the public hearing, ma'am. So there are no speakers for this item. Okay. We'll close the public hearing and entertain any additional questions or a motion from council. Mr. Arp? I would uh, make a motion that we move to approve the text amendments as presented. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. <coughs> any discussion on that motion? May I ask for your vote, please? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item 6.11. Ms. McDonald is going to is walking us through this process. Can we do something? Ms. McDonald's going to advise us the next step. We didn't approve the ability to address it in the special use of the men. Okay. We, <laughs> we might need to. Can uh, do I have the latitude to move the agenda around a little bit? Sure, you do. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, Between, are you ready to do your part, sir? Randy, yes, sir. come right up. <laughs> the staff back and say yes. <laughs> Bring him on. <laughs> they about sleep back there. Oh. So we're on a regular agenda item. This is item 7.3, so we'll give Mr. Hume an opportunity to go right ahead, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, w what we're bringing to you tonight are uh, a couple of uh, civil rights programs. As you know, we receive federal grants. Those have certain provisions of them, including certain civil rights provisions. We have to update those every three years. And uh, we, have, uh, we went through a competitive uh, process to uh, to find a consultant to help us do that uh, and that is uh, Colette Holt and Associates and uh, they have uh, been working on our Title VI program which is the overall overriding uh, civil rights program uh, the language or limited English proficiency uh, program which is part of Title VI and then the disadvantaged business enterprise program and uh, I will turn it over to her and let her do the presentation she's done a review of our program and uh, has some recommendations she's making to us as to how to uh, implement that, but also present the uh, uh, the the new program. So go ahead. thank you. So just hit. Oh yeah. Just hit the uh, enter. You can sit in your page okay. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you and good evening, and thank you all for having uh, us. I, I promise to be brief and not stand between people and dinner any longer. Um, my name's Colette Holt, and I am a consultant. I'm an attorney. Um, I actually did some work for the city of Fayetteville on these issues about uh, 10 years ago um, with the city attorney. I also have with me as part of uh, our team Bessie Papalius. 
uh, who uh, is recently retired from the Port of Oakland and had previously been the Title VI officer for the California Department of Transportation for many years. Um, we also had as part of our team Kim Stewart. She wasn't able to be with us today, but she was uh, assisted us with, uh, with data collection. So let me walk through this very quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about the DBE program, and then Bessie is going to talk about the Title VI and the LEP components. Um, the purpose of the, of the project was to review and update uh, the city's DBE and Title VI programs. And you see there on your screen the deliverables, uh, a report on both of those programs, uh, a draft program for the DBE uh, program that you can submit to the Federal Transit Administration, a Title VI uh, plan update also for FTA and as part of that a li limited English proficiency update. So we made several recommendations uh, for all, both elements of the project and I'll go through the DBE recommendations quickly. Uh, the first one and in some ways probably the most important one over the long term is to enhance the program's administration and staff resources and responsibilities. Um, they are doing yeoman's work uh, without a whole lot of, of support, and with the DBE liaison officer being a staff of one, um, and people really do seem to be spread extremely thin, um, especially based on my experience with dealing with literally dozens of transit authorities around the country uh, about what's necessary in order to have a fully compliant program that's also effective. Uh, the regulations also require that you develop a bidder's list, uh, and that has not happened yet. So we did make some suggestions about how to uh, get into compliance. We also suggest you review your annual DBE goal setting methodology uh, and the results. We did look at uh, several of the most recent semi-annual reports that you submit to FTA uh, and had some concerns about how that goal setting methodology had been applied in the results. Uh, you are due to submit a new triennial goal to FTA this summer. And as part of this project, we will be working uh, with Randy uh, and, and uh, Francis and, and others uh, to put that together for you and make sure that it is fully compliant. We also suggest that you should clarify how you're setting goals on individual contracts. As you probably know, uh, you can't set the same goal on every contract. Both the regulations and the courts require that that be narrowly tailored to the specifics of the job uh, that you're bidding. And so we had some suggestions about how to uh, do that as well. We think that you could do some, uh, make some revisions to enhance your policies and procedures to establish whether a bidder has made a good faith effort to meet the goal. It's important to stress that it's not a quota. Uh, it is a goal, but you do expect people to use their best faith efforts in order to meet it. Um, and that includes also uh, questions about how to evaluate a bid before award and then also what to do uh, when a DBE needs to be replaced on a contract. Some recent amendments to the federal regulations require that you now have very specific procedures to do this and we have made some recommendations and drafted uh, forms for your review uh, that would address those issues. Uh, you need to ensure that the, uh, the commitments that bidders make are in fact adhered to during contract compliance. So we had some suggestions about that as well uh, and put together some forms for you to use if you so choose uh, that will help to ensure that uh, people are complying during contract performance. Uh, and then improving your data retention and your data collection uh, processes we think is very important. Uh, you are required under the terms of your FTA grants uh, to do that and to have uh, data that can be replicated um, should you get an audit. Uh, and so we have suggestions about that um, as well. It includes data both on your contracts as well as data on the firms uh, that are bidding and quoting to you uh, on FTA assisted jobs. Um, finally, uh, the recent regulations do require you now to have explicit small business elements uh, in your program. Uh, and those are due to FTA basically now, uh, which is why I understand that what's on your agenda is to approve uh, those elements so that they can be submitted in a timely fashion, excuse me, to the Federal Transit Authority. Um, and so we had some suggestions about how to do that. Uh, actually, as it turns out, the city is doing a, a fair amount already to assist small businesses. Um, so that was, that was great to see that. You're ahead of a whole lot of other places um, in that respect. Uh, but we also think that there's some more uh, steps that you might take. Um, these include reviewing your bonding, insurance and experience requirements to make sure that they aren't greater than are really necessary uh, and they don't present a barrier to small firms. 
uh, partnering with other local agencies to assist firms with bonding. One of the things um, that we hear from DBEs everywhere is difficulty in accessing bonding. Um, I personally interviewed probably a thousand firms, literally, in the last few years, and everywhere I go, I hear this this problem. So uh, I know it's here too. So it's something I think you should address. Um, make sure that you're soliciting DBEs um, and small businesses for your informal contracts. If you have rotation contracts, make sure that they are included and called. Um, this is kind of the low-hanging fruit there uh, because you have a pretty high informal bidding threshold. $100,000 is, is higher than, than most agencies have, which gives you a lot of flexibility. So I, I think that you could do something there. Uh, make sure that you uh, have reviewed your contract language to encourage the use of DBEs and small firms, even on contracts that don't have goals. There's nothing wrong with saying this is a value to the city of Fayetteville, and we would like you to try to meet our values if you're going to do work for us. Um, and then also make sure that you collect data on the utilization of small firms. Um, you're collecting data on DBEs right now, uh, but you probably need to add that component so that you can tell FTA how well these measures are working. So with that, I'll turn over to Bessie uh, for Title VI. Oh, you press some enter will work. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as Colette mentioned, uh, we did find out today in meeting with staff that there are quite a few things that you are doing on a global level for the city. Um, our charge was to look at um, the FAST Title VI program and the LEP program plan that they had in place um, over the last three years. Uh, in review of that, one, one thing that we would like to recommend to the city on a global perspective is that they establish a civil rights umbrella. Although we are addressing the FAST requirement for FTA, for Title VI and LEP, um, you do you have a lot of other things that are going on, um, and centralizing the program will allow you to better use your resources and make sure that everything is compliant. Under Title VI, the city is the recipient of the federal aid funding. It is not FAST. So therefore, all your city programs are required to be equitable and non-discriminatory, whether they receive federal funding or not. So that is one consideration that we'd like to put up front for you. Um, in, in review, we um, that was the first one. We also suggest that you update your demographic data. The data is from 2005 to 2009. We have a 2010 census out. We, we request that you try to look at that and, and update the demographics for your region here. Um, address FAST proposed enhancements from the November 2009 Title VI plan. Um, you had five main areas that you talked about um, what, you're what you were proposing to do, which were included 25-foot um, motor coaches um, and um, enhancing those to 35-foot motor coaches, uh, collecting on-time data, et cetera. Uh, we couldn't find whether or not those were completed. Some of them were. If there's a different priority that you've set in those Title VI enhancements and they have changed, you need to report that back to the FTA um, and also put in any new enhancements that you're proposing over the next three years. Um, the other one was to determine system-wide policies. You say that you do this, but you have no criteria. To, as to how you establish those to ensure disparate, that there's no disparate treatment. Um, development of an environmental justice section. Uh, this is very critical, especially on all transportation projects. It's from the planning process to construction and maintenance. So that somehow has to be defined in your plan. That was uh, missing. We know that you do do Title VI assessments, but again, there were some pieces that were missing in that process. Demonstrate equal employment opportunity commitment. This is part of your overall civil rights umbrella, especially when you're doing contracts and employment, again. Uh, the other... The next piece was a review of all contract documents where we couldn't pinpoint whether or not you include the Title VI ADA requirements for your contractors. And this is something that you have to do and you have to include the language because it's passed down from the recipients to the subrecipients and the contractors are those subrecipients. Um, demonstrating uh, compliance with the ADA. This again was part of your enhancements that you proposed. We know that you did do some physical access upgrades and some programmatic upgrades. You should take credit for that in your Title VI plan as you submit it to FTA. And if you have anything planned over the next three years, again, include those as, as potential goals. Um, the other one is define and clarify the complaint process. While certain components of the complaint process were listed, 
we really didn't see where you would, um, what steps you would take to address the complaint itself. You gave everyone the ability to file the complaint, but we didn't see <laughs> the steps from, we got the complaint, thank you for sending it to us, now we're going to take 60 days to review it and get <coughs> back to you with a, with a resolution. Um, and again, tracking the equity complaints uh, across the city, not just in the FAST area. Uh, and then conducting public outreach and involvement. There was no distinct process in how you engage the public. We know that you do engage them at the city council meetings. We know that if you have large major projects, you will engage them through perhaps one or two public hearings. But how do you engage the public on an ongoing basis to let them know what the city is doing with respect to all their program areas? So we've developed a, a small process for that. And increasing access to information. We did recommend that you uh, develop, uh, as part of your website, uh, an informational section on LEP and Title VI that will address this, and also some Title VI brochures. We met with um, Human Relations today, and they did tell us that they do have a process for investigating complaints, and what we told them was, once you put out a brochure that says, these are your rights, be prepared that you will have some people um, accessing that, that process to say, well, I feel like I've been discriminated. So you will have an increase in complaints, but you may be able to address some process and procedural changes that need to be enhanced in your program. Um, we also reviewed the LEP um, plan, and uh, we again recommended that uh, you update your four-factor analysis, which is required by the, by the feds. Factor one, the number and proportion of LEP persons served and encountered in the eligible service population. Although we saw in the LEP plan that this was being done, we, didn't, we couldn't determine how it was being done. So we have some recommendations in our plan with that. Uh, the frequency of contact with LEP individuals, nothing was tracked per se. We know that uh, the, uh, the concerns of an LEP person, if someone comes to your office, they are, they are addressed. However, no one is keeping track of, we had 15 people in transit, we had five in human resources, et cetera. So you can determine what kind of needs you, need, you have as an agency. Factor three, the importance of fast services to LEP persons. If you, if you put it on a global basis, the importance of all your services to, of, in the city as a whole. So whether it's for contracting, whether it's for um, human resources, or again for transit services, you have to know what those, what those are. And the resources available to FAST and the cost. Um, as we met with staff, there were some services that staff didn't know about, yet the city has them. For example, you can contact a language service just by calling up and using your P-card and getting somebody on the other line. And this was done in, in some areas, but staff that was critical in knowing this did not know that that service was <coughs> available to them. So that needs to get out to everyone that may have potential contact with the public. Um, we really do recommend uh, establishing a module of training, and we do know that this was done, um, I believe, by the Equal Access under Human Relations, and we just want to make sure that everything is covered in that staff training, and increasing the access to information for these individuals. How do you address walk-in LEP individuals? Someone comes to your transit office, okay, and they don't speak Spanish, they speak Hmong, or they speak a dialect of Chinese. How are you going to address that? Somebody has to be able to do that. And so we have some recommendations about that uh, as far as uh, interaction with them and, and walk-in customers and also phone calls from LEP individuals. What we did was we listed some steps that we feel the agency should take as a whole and that it will address some of the needs that you do have. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. Yes, I think, I think. Here we have a couple of questions. Thank yes. Mr. Hare and then Ms. Applewhite. And then Mr. Fowler. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Attorney Hope, yes. you know, I've got one objective that's been close to me for some time and to um, the overall council. And I want you to do some clarity, some clarifications, make sure I'm speaking about the same thing. Uh, we talked about, uh, you mentioned something about this informing uh, bidding language. Oh, informal bidding. Informal bidding, and yes. you said that we had uh, an area of about one hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that because I want to see if that's the same thing okay. as um, what I'm speaking of. Okay. My understanding is that 
the city of Fayetteville's informal threshold mm -hmm. um, is $100,000, and that contracts under $100,000 um, are not subject to the full panoply of, of, of formal bidding procedures. Okay. That you need to get a minimum of three quotes um, and you can issue a purchase order as opposed to the more formal bidding um, with pre-bid conferences and everything that goes with a formal bid. That's my understanding. Okay, let, me, uh, let me take you step by step so okay. you don't explain too much for me. Let's just confirm. So, uh, well, okay. is, that, is that true, Mr. Bauer? Mr. Okay. Right. So that is okay. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead, sir. So I'm thinking maybe this is something different. I'm looking at you and over here at the city manager and the attorney that this is something different than this um, this $30,000. Um, Transportation fund, man. Yeah, but but is this only, okay, but I want is to, this, is this for a cross- the, the board of bidding, or are you speaking only for transit? Well, transit is all we looked at. Okay. And I certainly okay. want to okay. say, without a North a Carolina whisper. law license, then I'm not going to give you an opinion. And I was, starting to, I, want, I was started flapping my wings on something until I, I heard, so I want to pull it back in. I'll just pull it back in because I was gone. <laughs> I was on a mission. I had my questions lined up. Okay, then, but, okay, but speak on that, though. Uh -huh. But speak on the transit and tell me, uh, then can we direct that? to our small business folk within our city here, this, uh, this 100,000 informal bidding? Can so we sort of manipulate system. how we want to support our small business in, in Fayetteville? What we're really talking about is the process by which you procure something. And if it's a federally assisted contract, um, and you would like to make special outreach efforts to disadvantaged businesses and small businesses in the community, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, if you need to get three quotes, one of the things I always suggest is make sure that some of the, the, the firms that you contact are certified small businesses and DBEs. Make sure to do that. Um, what the feds will not let you do um, is run some type of a set-aside on federally assisted contracts. So you can't, you can't say we're only going to call local certified small businesses. Right. That you can't do. Um, but you certainly can make sure that they're in the pool. So it's about, yeah, I, I saw where you were going, I think, with this. Um, yes, ma'am, I was. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's hope it. You cannot run a local set aside on federally assisted dollars. Okay. Now, my other question in doing your data research, can you tell us just is there a small pool, is there a small amount that that was being done in our area, in our city of Fedville, as far as uh, small, uh, you know, th that were receiving uh, jobs? Well, I want to be clear. We, we certainly didn't do anything that begins to look like a disparity study or an availability study. So we didn't look at individual contracts. We, we, we certainly interviewed staff and asked them what their normal processes were. And my understanding is that they always make an effort to be sure to solicit DBEs for contracts where they or that are not subject to formal procurements. <clears throat> we wanted to be sure to stress um, that you continue to do that and that you also want to be sure to um, add small certified businesses to that pool um, so that you're making sure you have a, a, a good outreach. Um, you're required to take three. Maybe sometimes you'll take six, you know, if you think that that, that seems to be a, a good use of staff time. They'll have to use their judgment about that, I think. But you want to be sure that you are make that that everybody out there has an opportunity to quote to you on your informal projects. Okay, and my last question, I think, is then in your research, my question was, did you see any data? Did you see any information where this uh, one hundred thousand uh, informal bidding was being uh, that our local small businesses were being supported by that? Locally, no, no, was there any data to? So no, because we didn't look at any individual contracts. Okay. We didn't look at, at utilization that okay. way. Okay. Um, we have um, asked, and so we still have a little bit more research to do for you, um, kind of how the contracts fall out. Um, and the transit people think you have about maybe 10 or so a year yes, that are over 100 that are large and subject to competitive bidding. Most of the rest of them will fall under that. So we've asked to try to get a picture of what that looks like, uh, but it won't be contract by contract. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. It's so good to see you. Yeah, but nice to be back. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you uh, explain what the term um, 
an equity complaint is. Oh. You said we don't have a mechanism for tracking equity complaints across the city. What is that? Um, it's equal opportunity complaints, equity, that your all your programs are equitable and that everyone can uh, participate. So how do you track your Title VI complaints? We don't know. You just, I mean, there was no formal documentation in tracking that complaint so that you could report it back. Okay. And so we were recommending that all your complaints be tracked that way, whether they're ADA, employment, Title VI, whatever may come up under the civil rights umbrella. Under the civil and rights umbrella. we gave you a form for that. Right, and we gave and you we a form. we developed a form, a form mm -hmm. for you to do that. Right. Okay, that's good. And if I could ask Mr. Bauer, I think it's been about a year since I brought this whole LEP issue up, and our consultants are saying that there is the language service mechanism that you, you mentioned, and um, we have no way of tracking our contacts with LEP. Since this was brought to staff over a year ago, have we accomplished, do we know of, where are we in regards to the entire city's effort under the civil rights umbrella? Title VI, because as she's saying, it's a pretty well-known um, opportunity to use. I'm wondering, did we not research it, or where are we with our efforts? Well, it's my understanding, and I, I apologize, some of this information I'm hearing for the first time mm -hmm. tonight, which is a little frustrating, <laughs> uh, but um, my understanding is we do have that program in place, and we have uh, trained our staff on how they can use their P card, their procurement card, to access that should they need. I think one of the things they said tonight, again, which I find a little challenging, is that some of our staff don't under understand that resource is available. That is part of our for formal LEP plan, that that a tool is available to all of our staff should they have a, a problem and need translation services. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we found was that there was actually a lot going on, um, but perhaps more um, communication um, between departments. Um, I mean, for example, all of you should know that you have probably the right to do that, too. If a constituent were to call you who is limited um, English, you know, how would you handle it? So it's important to get that training out there, and so we certainly recommend more of it. Um, oh, that's good. And, that's and I think one of the things that we also thought would be helpful would be to develop written forms and, and procedures for you. And so we've done that. As part of this very thick packet that you got dropped on your desk there, um, you'll see at the back that there are all these forms and, uh, uh, and procedures for you that are, are samples for you to look at, adopt, change if you like, but that gives you something to, to use to actually implement That's good. Um, the program. So, so if I could, Mr. Bauer and Ms. McDonald, you've helped us with this because there were other comments about no tracking of our contacts with LEPs. Can we get, I would like to have an update on the accomplishments that staff has had since it's been a year, and if there are communications issues, not just under the transportation side, but across the um, city, if we could. A, a, a tracking thing from a year. And I, I would like to propose that we just expand that. I'm not sure that staff has seen all this report, and I really think this probably would have been better for a work session, but can we give staff the opportunity to review the report and then expect at a future work session, Mr. Bauer, that you come back with answers to and strategies to all of the... That'd be good. Um, ...to all the things that were spelled out. Yes, sir. And, and Mr. Hume, is he here? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't see you over the top. Um, there were several recommendations about staff being perhaps, you know, their plates are full with being able to um, become fully compliant. I can't read my little gibberish here, but collection of data and um, being DBE staff. With our budget del deliberations, have you included additional staffing to address the Title VI issues that they may have identified, or would you have to revisit your request for staffing? We, we did not include a uh, request for additional staff uh, to do this. We did not have the report at the time we were put in our budget. Uh, one of the items the report did mention is some of that may not be full-time staff, but it might be contracted mm -hmm. staff that we might use to do that. So you, what, would you agree that it's outside your, the needs are greater than what you have and whether it's contracting or, or full-time personnel that there will be a cost associated with implementing this? There would be some cost. I think in terms of some of this is we, we could cover with our planning grants. Okay. So as we set that up through the, 
through the process, we can recover some of that through planning grants, both through contract provision as well as as, as staffing, if we would use that. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. But, but it is not in. It's, there's not extra in the budget for it mm -hmm. in the proposed. Say that budget again. Budget. There is not extra in the proposed budget right now. Okay, but these. you you're anticipating addressing that, and because I, I'm going to assume Title VI federal requirements, we it's not a if we want to do it, but we kind of have to do That's it. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, the other thing I could add is that. Um, at least for the DBE program, for sure, um, though expenses related to that are reimbursable expense usually. Now, they won't give you any more money for it, but you can yes, use some federal money um, to support the program if you need to, too. Perfect. Mr. Thank Jim, you. When did you get this report, sir? Uh, we, we got it about, uh, I guess it was last last week. Mm -hmm. or it's either the end of the previous week or, or the beginning of last week. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have not had it very, very long either. And Mr. Fowler? I think my question will probably have to be answered after Mr. Bauer has a chance to look at this, but I'm just trying to get a finger on how much you think all these changes you're suggesting are going to cost and where the money's going to come from, whether it be federal dollars, city dollars, or what. I, I can't say. I think my suggestion would be um, to take a look at the recommendations, see where you think you can integrate them into your current operations. So, for example, making sure that everybody knows what you're already doing, um, that's it's staff costs in the sense of <coughs> time, but it's not going to cost you money. Um, so make sure that we've covered everything and then try to figure out um, how, how it would cost. I, I couldn't even begin to speculate. Okay. I don't think and we're talking you, about a lot of money, but it, it won't be free. And are you saying that if these aren't done that uh, we'll lose funds? Is that what oh, you're no, saying? no. I would never predict what FTA would do. Okay. All I can say is that if they come in and they audit you and they find that you're out of compliance, in theory, they certainly could refuse to fund you. Okay. That would hurt. <laughs> <coughs> Shirley, hold on, I want to thank you and your staff for providing us with this information. Oh, and uh, Ms. Applewhite, I concur with your request 200%. Thank you. And that we need to get this information. And I think you hit it on the head, or you hit it on the head when you said there's so much going on around here. There's, there's so many times the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if we just enhance our communication and look at what we presently do have, we might be surprised at what we will be able to do once we know what to focus on. Thank you. Any additional questions? Hey, could we entertain a motion, I guess, to uh, so, accept the report? So moved. Motion to accept. Second. Uh, Mr. Massey, Ms. Applewhite, second. Any discussion on that? This is, this is to accept the report. Yeah. Not to approve all those recommendations. No, accept the report. Thank you. Uh, I think that's all we can do. <laughs> that was what, yeah. that was what the motion was. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chris. <laughs> it takes me a long time to read this kind of stuff. I need everyone to vote. Mr. Mayor, if I, if, if I yes. could, uh, one clarification. One of the reasons this came up uh, so suddenly is the small business component that was added to DBE was, is a new provision that we were given very short time. To, to implement. And so we have a deadline that we have to submit that to FTA or we will be out of compliance. And so uh, that, that's one of the reasons this was pushed now. Again, the programs aren't really due till August, but, uh, but we had to push this one a little sooner. Good stuff. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, I think we're back now to 611. And Ms. Applewhite, can you advise us on that? Is that I think we've elected Ms. Mr. Bates, uh, Ms. McDonald. Sorry, oh. Colonel Applewhite. <laughs> Ms. McDonald, um, old woman. <laughs> item six point eleven. Mr. Bates has. We're still following that. We're going to defer this. My, uh, my recommendation, and I have um, spoken with the applicant, uh, but my recommendation is based on your action in six point nine. Um, that you defer action on 6.11. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, 6.9 is coming to the work session, and then we'll, we'll May, 7th. May 7th, and then we'll do it after that. Right? Isn't that what we decided on 6.9 yes, is going right. to the work session, Keith? That's what, um, they were, with all your conferences in and discussion, and well, I make that motion that Ms. McDonald stated that based on decision on item 6.9, we defer <clears throat> the public hearing tonight until a further date. 
Right. We didn't discuss a date, but my understanding is they're making a request well, for the. Well, I, I don't want to. We can't commit ourselves. I want to make sure it comes back to work session first. Right. Well, six nine is is definitely coming back to the work session. That yes. we've already taken that action. <coughs> after this will come back after that. After we get done with six nine. Okay. So a motion to defer action on six eleven. Yes. Six point one one. Have a mo is that your motion, Mr. Bates? Is there a second of that motion, Mr. Hare? Any discussion on the motion? Ask for your vote, please. Uh, I, can't, I can't get it advertised. I can't get it. Advertised. I'm sorry. We can't get it ever if we're discussing this with council on the 7th we can't get it advertised by the 14th we're not committing anything to the 14th we're just saying that uh, the only commitment is the work session in May for item 6.9 we understand we can't advertise so we're not deferring this to a date for certain yes no not this one we're not doing what this we're isn't deferred to a date, date certain. certain because we have to right, do we got to do the work session for okay thank you no date certain on this particular motion. Is everybody clear on that? It's just deferring the action. We'll deal with item 6.9 at the work session in May and then move as quickly as we can after that. I'm ask for your vote, please, Mr. Fowler. Thank you, sir. All right, that's unanimous. Okay, we'll move now to item 7.1, which is an update from the Chamber of Commerce and Ms. Rebecca Rogers Carter. And I know that uh, you're all probably getting very tired. I do have some important information to share with you. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'll get through this uh, as quickly as I can. I'm here to report the third quarter uh, of the 2011-2012 fiscal year related to economic development from the chamber. Um, what I've done first is outline the five priorities of our organization that I believe mesh very well with uh, the critical actions uh, that the, the city uh, continues to pursue. Uh, I'll let you review those at your leisure. You should have a copy of this, by the way. It was sent over uh, electronically. So uh, if you don't, let me know, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you have one. Um, so those are the, the five priorities. Um, job creation uh, and uh, the retention of, of jobs. Uh, priority two is uh, leveraging the continuing BRAC buildup to make sure that we're improving our community's infrastructure. Uh, three is to enhance quality of place available locally. Uh, and uh, we're, we're on our, our path to do that. Four is develop and execute effective strategies to reduce crime, beautify, and improve the overall livability of the community. And then five is to make sure that the <coughs> members, the business community uh, that the chamber represents are in fact uh, satisfied with their investment. Uh, a quick reminder of our economic development staff. You heard earlier tonight in, in uh, uh, your se or earlier session that Doug Bird uh, will be leaving the organization. He will be retiring, I think, for the third time, this time officially, mm -hmm. um, uh, after being with the Department of Commerce and also with uh, the, the, uh, the Jacksonville Economic Development Group. Uh, Doug will be leaving uh, on Thursday. We'll have a reception Monday night where we will also introduce our new Executive Vice President for Economic Development, uh, who will be coming to us uh, from inside the state. Um, let me uh, go quickly to the recognizing the new and expanding uh, business, and then I'll share with you what our targets were. Uh, here's a, a rundown of those companies that, uh, that we have been a part of assisting. Uh, you'll see that uh, two of those, a defense contractor and a contract manufacturer, one in the mold uh, uh, industry, the other was a defense contractor representing an engineering firm. Um, both of those have asked uh, because they were not subject to any incentives that they remain anonymous. Um, we can talk with you confidentially offline uh, further about those companies if you choose. Hendrick Chrysler Jeep is uh, renovating a facility on Cliffdale Road. They've finally gotten through the permitting process and uh, are, are uh, moving forward there, uh, creation of 20 jobs, $4.5 million in new investment. Um, the uh, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, to substantiate the, the very bold investment that the community made several years ago, 
has invested an additional $13 million, and we expect that uh, investment to continue. Uh, that does not result in the creation of any net new jobs, but the good news is that it does not result in the loss of any jobs. If you remember, part of their plan was to automate and modernize their facility, uh, and they have, in fact, added several hundred jobs as a result of that investment. Um, Market Square is one that was announced, uh, uh, I think it was in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that is the 100 block of Hay Street, uh, $2.5 million investment and uh, the creation of 50 jobs. Uh, uh, so uh, to date, uh, for the third quarter, 192 uh, jobs created, $25,791,000 um, in capital investment. Here is uh, what our targets were. Um, if you look at uh, the, the capital investment, our contractual arrangement puts us at $116 million. We're at 148. We expect there to be uh, two announcements that will significantly increase that, uh, that number. Job creation, let me just quickly address, and I'm sure that all of you know this, in a presidential election year, jobs are typically slow to be created, uh, but we do expect sometime within the next three to six months there to be the announcement of about uh, 1,800 new jobs in the community from two different employers' projects that, uh, that we expect uh, fully uh, that will be successful in landing. <coughs> Attention visits, we call on 75 existing companies, uh, existing manufacturers every year. We're at 62 uh, after the third quarter. Client uh, prospect contacts, to remind you, that is cold calls on um, uh, companies that we want to tell the Fayetteville Cumberland County story to. Uh, we said that we would talk with 150. To date, we're at 140. And then marketing opportunities, we're at 11. We continue to invest in our web presence, uh, which is at the request of the site selection consultant community. Uh, we also, as we go out and talk to, if you look at the, the fourth line down there, the client I'm sorry, the third line down, the retention visits, we use a, a, an industry standard software called Synchronist, and we, go, we ask them a series of very pointed questions about their satisfaction uh, with the community and their ability to do business here uh, so that we can cite trends and, uh, and be able to act before something becomes an issue. Um, the following numbers that I'm going to share with you, and I will not go into great detail, one is a low score, seven is a high score, and if you look um, at, at this particular chart, it shows you um, exactly how folks uh, in industry are rating services available here in the community. Now, not all of those are city, some are county, some are private, um, but it is a, an accurate um, indicator of, of how well uh, we're performing against the expectations or how, what the satisfaction level is of those companies that are currently invested here. So I'll show that one. Six percent. I'm right. sorry, sir. Six. Seven. 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 Yes, sir. Um, you have to walk on water to, to ever get a seven. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I've been using synchronous for a long time. I've never seen really anything more than a six and a half, and that was uh, that was a rarity. Um, hey, Mr. Peters, yes, quick sir. question. This is a measure that we use against ourselves. Do, do similar Communities use the same measure? Is there a way we can measure how we rack yeah. and stack against other communities? I'm glad you asked that question. I think all of you are aware, in fact, the city manager sits on a steering committee uh, that, we're, uh, that we've put together. Uh, we, we hired a, a firm called Garner Economics, uh, who is conducting a very in-depth strategic planning process for economic development unique to this community. There are two specific uh, uh, communities out there that we're going to be benchmarking ourselves against. One is Huntsville, one is Augusta, and then of course we do our traditional benchmarking against Greenville, Greensboro, um, Wilmington, and Jacksonville inside the state, which are, are similar communities. So we do have data there. Uh, in addition to those, those numbers, which don't tell you a lot of what led to the, the, those rankings, we also are compiling a tremendous amount of data related to overall costs, uh, cost inside the city, cost outside the city, cost for utilities, cost for land, labor, all the things that go into a site selection. Uh, and, and that will all be shared with, uh, with you if, if you have an interest. Um, this is looking at public service, police, fire, EMT. Uh, it goes uh, into to, uh, schools K-12. And I can tell you that uh, our 5.1 
uh, five ranking does rank higher than some of our competitors using the same uh, methodology and the same software. Um, this uh, again talks about uh, public transportation. Uh, you can see that that is probably where we lack uh, in some of that. I believe that if you look at the community, most of our industry is outside the city uh, per se. There are issues related to public transportation in moving employees to the work site. Um, air passenger service, um, I think that this number will go back up because uh, we, we were told, and I think a lot of our industry was under the impression that the direct flights to Washington were going to be exorbitantly priced. We have found that not to be the case. Uh, in fact, we believe that they are now uh, very competitive with RDU. Uh, so that number will go back up as folks uh, are able to experience that. Um, Property taxes uh, is, is a, an issue, um, particularly combined property taxes, but uh, we're working toward a solution there. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the city for their assistance in helping us to, uh, to, to move that, uh, that needle. Um, and then uh, count, we, we also got a ranking on uh, traditional county services, state workforce initiatives, uh, and so on. Let me give you an update quickly on uh, the Murchison Road Redevelopment Plan. Uh, you'll note that there is a, a red flag area there, funding allocation. Uh, that will be up to you once purchase options are secured. I will tell you that there are, uh, we, we continue to focus on the area of Jasper <coughs> Street and Murchison Road. Uh, there are uh, about seven different properties that have been approached. Uh, negotiation uh, on uh, two of those are taking place. There is an additional property just south of the Jasper Street intersection uh, that has a very exciting plan that we're working with currently uh, that we believe will be, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to hedge here, but uh, could be very transformational for that entire corridor. And of course, with what we're seeing out of um, uh, Fayetteville State uh, and then what's happening at the north with the interchange. Uh, we expect uh, continued good things. So uh, the next time that I'm before you will be at the close of the, the fiscal year, fourth quarter report. There should be some, some pretty profound uh, advancement made on that Murchison Road uh, plan. Hope Six Business Park, I'm very happy to tell you that, uh, and I think Victor, no, Victor's still here. Uh, Victor Sharp and I met this morning uh, and went over uh, the the uh, proposal, uh, we do have the green light now to proceed. Uh, one of the, the most recent hiccups was the market analysis firm that was, uh, that was um, I, I guess, committed to by the city. We had to integrate with the folks that were doing the site planning and some other work uh, for us. That has been done. We have a conference call scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, and I think the date we agreed on, Victor, this morning was June 4th. Uh, for an overview to council using those consultants, having them bring you up to speed on where we stand with that particular project. But it is moving, uh, and it's moving well at this point. Uh, the PwC Campus for uh, Advanced Sustainability, uh, they are currently undergoing a market analysis, uh, and uh, I believe that that contract has been let. The, uh, the community, Sustainable Communities Foundation Board has not met recently. Uh, but I believe that they will once they have something to sit, uh, sit at the table and to go over, which is the product that has been, um, has been uh, um, paid for in that market analysis to, to substantiate whether or not uh, that, that uh, camp uh, campus for sustainability theme would be supported here in this particular market. And I'm happy to answer, of course, any questions that you have. Any questions for uh, Mr. Peters? Again, I missed it. I'm sorry. What? Let me start over it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, I'm not sure we did get that report. You didn't get it. In, uh, in, I didn't. I'm not sure if other people got that, so I don't know where those get sent. But um, it's on this computer, and you can keep it. Uh, well, so thank. That's we're, what we we're trying to cut expenses. Exactly, we want it. Thank you. So, so we're not. Uh, okay. I apologize. We're, we're trying to cut back on costs. Yeah, if you could get those to us. Uh, in the future, that way we'd have the opportunity to review them. I think we'd like a copy of this, too, if you could get that, Rebecca. Thank you, sir. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Sir? I'm sorry. I, I thought you already asked your question. That was earlier question. Okay. Question? No, I think that was his earlier question. We're, we're good. Sorry. Thank you. Like some John Lupe hey, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of Council. 
Um, item 7.1B on your agenda is the presentation of our third quarter strategic plan report. Council, in your agenda packet, you receive the full narrative report, which details the background and action plans of these items. And I also brought with me, and you should have before you, um, a color handout. Do we hand that out, yeah. Madam Clerk? Yeah. It's coming around. Okay, thank you um, for the opportunity to quickly walk us briefly through the achievements in the third quarter. Um, I'd like to mention that strategic planning is a critical component of a much larger system that requires discipline and long-term planning. The report tonight focuses on the evaluation, which allows our organization to stay on track and also to respond to the changing environments. The City of Fayetteville has a comprehensive strategic planning model that takes council and staff through an annual process of understanding <coughs> where we are as an organization, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there. Our vision statement reflects the community that we hope to achieve through our actions today. Our partnerships throughout the community will ensure that the city of Fayetteville is a great place to live, one that is vibrant and sustainable. Our mission statement identifies for our employees and, our, and the citizens of Fayetteville our organizational role in pursuing that community vision. And council, like you, city staff, is committed to providing these services to our community with respect so that we can do our part to safeguard and enhance the public trust in local government. Our plan also sets forth uh, the path our organization must follow in order to reach the community's vision. They include growing our tax base, uh, becoming more an efficient city government, and taking steps to move our community forward in unity. From these goals, Council, you develop a work plan for this fiscal year with 27 targets for action, and it is um, these um, items that your report tonight focuses on. Staff is working to develop a <coughs> potential bond referendum that will sustain previous park investments and enhance the quality of life for the current citizens and future generations. This quarter, staff focused on outreach and presented information to many community leaders. We also developed a proposal for an educational campaign and included the resources needed in the budget. The police substation project analyzed the feasibility of adding police substations in strategic locations throughout the city. The study was completed and the consultant briefed city council in the third quarter. The recommendations covered options for the creation of two police substations, one for each service bureau. The FAST Improvements Project supports the City's goal of providing a more efficient and effective City Government service. This quarter, we initiated Route 9 bus service for Ramsey and Andrews Road. Also, the Fayetteville Advisory Committee on Transit presented recommendations to Council for fiscal year 2013 service improvements. The Transit Department has also been working on several promising grant proposals, which are also outlined in your report this evening. The building demolition, demolition program supports the goal of more attractive city by prioritizing the use of building demolition funds. During the third quarter, staff developed a title search program in coordination with our real estate division where 109 properties were identified for a June 30th estimation completion date. The city partners with the Fayetteville Cumberland County Chamber of Commerce for economic development activities. And I thank Mr. Peters for being here this evening for that update. The sign ordinance target for action focuses on developing a modernized sign ordinance that is consistent with the UDO. A schedule of advisory focus groups is being developed as the planning division works to fill the urban designer position. And the street lighting ordinance project follows the implementation of an ordinance designed to establish uniformity for the locations of lights as well as how the lights are paid for. The engineering and infrastructure department distributed a letter requesting lighting providers to provide a 90-day implementation plan for areas that do not meet our lighting standards. To date, the city has received written responses from four of the three providers uh, three of the four providers. Basically, the responses state that the providers would address the existing lighting deficiencies identified either um, by their customers or the city. City staff will continue to work with neighborhoods to guide them through each provider's process. Council, recognizing that hiring and retaining quality staff 
is a critical aspect of providing excellent service to citizens, and you've requested a comprehensive compensation plan. During March work session, Council had the opportunity to review the study outcomes and the recommendations from the consultants. Council provided approval to move forward with the compensation study implementation, and staff is working on implementation options. The Solid Waste Contracting for Services project sought to research and explore opportunities for outsourcing city services. Early in the third quarter, the RFP and city cost information was presented to Council. Following that presentation, additional information was prepared and presented to Council. The analysis indicated that it was more efficient and effective for the city to continue to provide all garbage collection than to utilize a service provider for a portion of the city. City Council's direction to staff was not to proceed with contracting out the services and to reject the proposals. Fayetteville Beautiful is dedicated to encouraging others to take greater responsibility for improving their environment. They receive weekly requests for volunteer support to help with cleanup and beautification projects. And in the third quarter, Fayetteville Beautiful and city staff were busy planning the spring cleanup held this past Saturday. Over 1,000 volunteers picked up more than 35,000 pounds of trash and litter, and we sincerely thank each of them for making Fayetteville a better place for all. Council will now move to your management agenda. The Bragg Boulevard Corridor de a development focuses on the redevelopment of this area, which is essential to Fayetteville's transportation infrastructure, especially as we construct I-295. And in cooperation with the Fort Bragg Regional Alliance, staff developed and issued an RFP to solicit firms. Staff tells me that we have had a robust response from, pro from the private sector and contract negotiation is underway. After two years of hard work and community collaboration, the Fayetteville Regional Airport was rewarded with a U.S. Airways round-trip direct flight to our nation's capital. And the service began this quarter, well, in the third quarter, on March 25th. The Reclaiming Neighborhoods Projects takes a holistic approach to the problems in specific neighborhoods. The police department issued a staff final report on the Bonnie Dune focus area, and staff will continue to build their relationships with the local leaders and consider the efforts of this project a success. The police department also made a determination on the next focus areas. They will conduct a reclamation project in two districts simultaneously, the locations identified are the Bunce Road area in the Cross Creek District and the Murkison Road Jasper Street area in the Campbellton District. The Hope Six um, Park Business Development Project will address economic development activities in the Hope Six area. We just heard that report from uh, Mr. Peters. The Communication Strategy Project seeks to follow efforts to develop improvements in effectiveness, policy, and protocol. And I am very pleased to share with you that in the third quarter, we received four awards for excellence in communications by the North Carolina City and County Communicators, which showcases the best of the best in local government communications in North Carolina. We earned first place for our 2011 annual report to the community, first place for the All-America City Strategic Marketing Plan, first place for the Park and Recreation Activities Guide, and second place for citizen participation in our Citizens Academy program. I'd like to recognize tonight the efforts of your com corporate communication staff, Jennifer Lowe, our public information officer, Nathan Walls, our assistant public information officer, Kenneth Maynor, our graphic designer, and I also wish to thank our fellow city employees that support our efforts every day. During the third quarter, staff focused on wrapping up the All-America City Marketing Campaign by making those final arrangements and by planning the final, the big finale. We're also preparing for our, our Spring Citizens Academy, which started last week, growing our social media platforms <coughs> and working to improve some communication tools and practices. The Limited English Proficiency Project followed the development of an overarching citywide policy that identified steps to mitigate the language barriers in providing services to our citizens. This quarter, staff worked to consolidate a list of the bilingual city employees to be used in language assistance, and staff developed an LEP curriculum for the city employee training classes. And as a result, um, and in light of tonight's presentation, staff will review the consultant's report and bring recommendations to council work session. 
Um, an RFP for the old uh, days in site development was issued and advertised earlier this year, but we did not receive a response. This quarter, the team revised the RS RFP to include rental properties and minor commercial um, and plans to reissue the RFP. And this year, staff concentrated on the land assembly and design for the multimodal center. Uh, the schematic design is now complete and work continues with the coordination of utilities, zoning, and adjacent street properties. And finally, staff completed a competitive grant application that was submitted for the construction of the facility under the FTA's bus livability initiative. The Prince Charles Hotel is a historic landmark downtown. Unfortunately, conditions were such that the building was declared dangerous and ordered vacated last October. Staff will continue enforcement action to persuade property owner to achieve full code compliance and in the third quarter initiated foreclosure of code um, enforcement violation liens. Currently, our community has two public safety answering points. One is managed by the county and the other the city. This project follow, um, seeks to follow the efforts to consolidate those 911 operations. Coordinate, coordination efforts are focused uh, by merging the CAD systems into one, and the actual merger was accomplished in February. So now the city and the county are working on the same CAD system, which decreases, of course, response times for our citizens. The ramp program has been a priority for several years. The work efforts relate to city council and staff's desire to identify and better manage any negative impacts of residential rental property citywide. This quarter, our efforts were rewarded as city council approved the new program with an effective date of July 1st. This fiscal year, our community celebrated the opening of North Carolina Veterans Park, a beautiful living park that has changed the face of Fayetteville's downtown and is designed to honor veterans of all military branches. This quarter, we finalized and closed out the contracts and completed the installation of the North Carolina dog tag display. The park continues to be celebrated as a huge success and, and a tribute to those that are honored. Rotating historical exhibits are placed in the visitor center. For example, in February, an exhibit on the contributions of the North Carolina African Americans during World War II was displayed. The city gained ownership of the Festival Park Plaza and is improving the occupancy rate. And the city manager's office will continue to, excuse me, to monitor and assess the climate for future use of the building. And the city, of course, will work with the Chamber of Commerce to support the redevelopment of the Mer Murkison Road Corridor. Um, the body of work represented in this strategic plan re report is directly related to this organization's commitment to continuous planning, evaluation, and reporting. As council members, you are the policy makers of this very complex and diverse organization. The investments made today will keep the organization and our community moving forward. Uh, council, again, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you and the citizens the progress we've made on our targets for action. I would uh, like to recognize and thank the project liaisons who held with me and are here this evening. And I'd like to point out that the report and the strategic plan is also available on our website. And with that, I would ask that you accept the report, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have or direct them to your project liaisons. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Okay, could we have a motion to accept the report, Mr. Bates? Motion to accept the report. Thank you, sir. Is there a second to that, Mr. Second Hart? Second a motion to accept the report. All right, Mr. Chris, any uh, discussion on that motion? Ask for your vote, please. Uh, that's unanimous. Congratulations. Thanks for Thank your you. hard work on that. Ready yes, for me to go. Um, I do want to let you know that one of the things that uh, brought me to this community was how serious you took um, uh, addressing blight situations. And uh, of course, that was before I knew where you put it on the agenda. <laughs> um, we, ha we have six uh, residential uh, dwellings uh, that are blighted, none are historic. And um, I'll go through each of them briefly. Uh, the first one is uh, 7131 Ashwood uh, Circle. This was a storm damage structure. Uh, utilities have been off since uh, April of 2011. 
Uh, there have been 29 calls for 9-11 service in the past 11 months, which is uh, very significant. Um, 7526 Bethesda Court, also storm damaged, uh, no power since the tornado. Uh, five calls for 911 service and one code violation, uh, but you can see it's extensively damaged. Uh, 1018 Ellis Street, uh, this was fire damaged and uh, uh, the utilities have been off for about nine months. Um, again, you can see the condition of that structure. Uh, 908 Marsh Street, um, this one has been without uh, power for seven years, more or less, and uh, three calls for 911 service uh, in the past 24 months. Um, three code violations in the past 24 months. Um, and uh, 525 Mechanic Street, uh, this one again, uh, this is a five year uh, uh, disconnect of utilities almost exactly. Uh, eight calls for service, uh, five code violations, um, a, uh, certainly a problem for us. And the last one is 2325 Rose Hill Road, uh, fire damaged, um, and uh, 41 calls for 9-11 service. Uh, that one is a record as far as I know uh, in a 24 month period. Uh, so uh, a real problem property. And we would ask for your approval to proceed with, through our process and uh, head towards demolition of these six structures. Ms. Davey, uh, then Ms. Terry, and then Mr. Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Shuford. I just wanted, um, I, I can't speak on all the properties, but just one specifically, the 1018 Ellis Street. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say for the record, that property owner has taken out permits, correct? And they're working on that. That That is not how the structure looks currently. That, that's correct. I think they have, um, let's if I can get the... Um, pointer up here that I think they've started work on replacing some of the siding and uh, what we uh, have been able to do in, in many of these <coughs> cases is when people are showing good faith effort to move forward uh, we work with them and, and set guidelines milestones for them to uh, achieve and uh, your actions uh, are very helpful for us uh, to keep pressure on them to keep them uh, uh, actively moving forward in the process and obviously we're uh, we're not um, interested in uh, demolishing buildings that can become uh, viable parts of a community but uh, we do need to uh, have your your support in making sure that we uh, are able to stay on top of these problems okay. so if the if the applicant does approach you all pull out the permits and is working on the project on a consistent basis showing good faith Yes, ma'am. Measure, as you said, that there is a um, program worked out for them. We, we do. We have a process that we worked out with the uh, city attorney's office where they, they sign, a, a, in effect, a contract saying that they will achieve these goals over this period of time. And uh, uh, if they're successful, then uh, everyone's a winner. And that's what we want to see. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Scott, thank you. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but maybe you can because... I asked, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, uh, when would we be having the information coming back to us, if you are aware, or maybe the city manager, on how long we're gonna, we can allow these structures to be boarded up? When is that going to come back to us for a discussion? Uh, we, can, we need to bring that one back to you, and uh, I, 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 can, like I cannot years. commit to having it, I cannot commit to having it to you at your uh, May 7th uh, a work session, but certainly by the the June time frame, if that's uh, available, we will uh, we will touch base with you on the boarded structures. Okay, but you were aware. I mean, you yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. All Mr. right. Fowler. Thank you. Disregard. Disregard. Okay. Any other questions, or is there a motion, Mr. Bates? Motion to approve the demolition orders as presented. Do I need to name each street, or? Yes, sir. I think you just. Adopt the ordinance and demolish the structures, I think, would be Yes, sir. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Massey. Uh, what's happening? Why it's okay with the work being done, have they not followed through on uh, the uh, plan or what? 
Well, we have not entered into that same contract with them, to my knowledge, Mr. Massey. What we do is we take them through this process. We get your okay to proceed to demolition. And then if they approach us, uh, they've had a chance. Remember, that we, we go through this process. It takes a minimum of 97 days to get uh, to where we are tonight. I don't know how long Ellis Street has been there, but it's probably been longer than that. And they have had opportunity upon opportunity to uh, work with us and, and propose something that would uh, uh, be successful. Now, we have had success stories uh, where uh, your action uh, sends a clear message and we're able to, uh, to get people to, to really uh, buckle down and, and fix uh, these homes up. Uh, but there are occasionally situations where um, uh, they, they enter into the idea with the, uh, the best of intent and they just can't make it happen and we are able to move forward to, uh, to demolition. Understood. Thank you. Ask for your vote, please. That's unanimous. Thank you. We have one more uh, item here. Council uh, staff told me we do need to make one modification to the, the report received on the transit. We do need to approve the small business section of the report. That was what the timeliness that was required tonight. So we it's do need section 26.39. Okay. So if you could just actually have a motion to uh, approve uh, 26.39 as a policy. Um, I will also say that there are a couple of provisions in here that we will come back to you with some corrections and adjustments, uh, but we need to have something in place in the next 10 days. So if you could kind of put this in as an interim place, and we'll bring it back to you and have a conversation with you in the within the next 60 days. I need to make a, a motion to approve the small business section 26.39. Have that Mr. Massey second. Mr. Bates, any discussion on that? Ask for your vote, please. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, that's unanimous. Anything else to come before council tonight? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn? All right, sir.